The following study is going to be an exploration of some of the quotes from the Baha'i writings related to the unity of religion. In this study, we're going to try and take a look at how we can begin to see these apparently disparate faiths, like Judaism or Christianity or Islam and Buddhism, how we can see them as one and begin to look at avenues of approach to unifying them. Dear friends, thank you for joining us. Um, please note that this is only a personal interpretation of the Baha'i teachings. If you wish to have an authoritative stance, please go to baha'i.org. I want to thank the Baha'i administration, all those working in their neighborhoods, and anyone who is trying to work for the betterment of the world. Please note that in the description below you'll be able to find an MP3 version of this, so you don't have to watch it, um, but also a PDF of all the quotes that will be used in any of the deepenings, and timestamps of the different sections. And please subscribe if you'd like to be alerted for any upcoming videos. So we're going to start here with a series of quotes, three from Baha'u'llah and one from Abdul Baha. All men will adhere to one religion, will have one common faith, will be blended into one race and become a single people. All will dwell in one common fatherland, which is the planet itself. That which God hath ordained as a sovereign remedy and mightiest instrument for the healing of the world is the union of all its people in one universal cause, one common faith. That which the Lord hath ordained as a sovereign remedy and mightiest instrument for the healing of all the world, is the union of all its peoples in one universal cause, one common faith. This can in no wise be achieved except through the power of a skilled and all-powerful and inspired physician. This verily is the truth, and all else naught but error. The purging of such deeply rooted and overwhelming corruptions cannot be effected unless the peoples of the world unite in pursuit of one common aim and embrace one universal faith. So in these quotes, the central figures, in this case Baha'u'llah and Abdu Baha, clearly state that the Baha'i position is that the sovereign remedy for the healing of the ills of this world is the unity of humankind within one common faith, within one universal cause. And that this cannot be achieved save by the hand of the Divine Physician, the manifestation of God. That this is not a purely social interaction just between people, but is given unto us from God through the revelation of Baha'u'llah. And it is through the power of the Holy Spirit that humankind will be united. It also states that we believe that the quote, purging of such deeply rooted and overwhelming corruptions cannot be achieved unless we come together in the unity of pursuit for one common aim and embrace one universal faith. Now for many individuals this seems peculiar, and we will actually look at that aspect of it as we move on, that we see that the world itself will actually become united. And as peculiar as this may seem, uh, we have to remember that all of Europe was united under the cause of Christianity. That actually many disparate communities within and around the Empire of Persia were brought together under Zoroastrianism. That very many different kinds of beliefs and pursuits and goals and aims are under the umbrella of Hinduism and the transformative power of Buddhism within Asia and Southeast Asia. We also suggest that you take a look at our video on uh, Is the Baha'i Faith a Utopian Vision, which may also help to understand this facet. How sweet and glorious to remember in these days of strife and turmoil, how the mighty hand of our beloved Abdul Baha has gathered together people of diverse tongues and distant climes, and united their hearts in one common spirit of love and servitude to the sacred threshold of Baha'u'llah. The spirit that has achieved so great a measure of reconciliation is today the one factor that can, amid the unceasing contentions of races, nations, creeds, and classes, assure to this disillusioned world the reign of true felicity and peace. 
that it is the Baha'i Faith's teachings that is the one factor that can bring a disillusioned humankind together to finally see the world itself as one motherland, as one real true community, a world in which Yes, we have many chapters, many different chapters to our spiritual history, and many different symbols and expressions of those underlying unities that we can find through investigation and exploration of the different traditions of our world. This next quote is from Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of the Baha'i Faith. Therein lies the strength of the unity of the faith, of the validity of a revelation that claims not to destroy or belittle previous revelations but to connect, unify, and fulfill them. In this quote, Shoghi Effendi states that the Baha'i Faith does not claim to destroy or belittle previous revelations, but to connect, unify, and fulfill them. So it is an expression of integration, not disintegration, of fulfillment, not eradication, of a greater expression in unifying rather than an abrogation of previous dispensations. That from a Baha'i perspective, the fullness and the beauty and the profundity of, say, Moses was actually manifested within the person of Jesus Christ. That it is actually through the Buddha that we more fully understand the original teachings of Hinduism. That yes, as with Islam, it actually enabled us to have a greater vision and a deeper understanding of the original traditions of Judaism and Christianity. And that each of these gives us light that can actually lead through the darkness when we're studying something like Zoroastrianism, which I believe um, any observer who wishes to study it will see as intimately connected with the revelations both of Judaism and of Christianity. So the following is another quote from the guardian of the Baha'i Faith, Shoghi Effendi, from the World Order of Baha'u'llah. And we're going to break it down into sections so we can see each chunk uh, as a piece. The revelation, of which Baha'u'llah is the source and center, abrogates none of the religions that have preceded it, nor does it attempt, in the slightest degree, to distort their features or to belittle their value. It disclaims any intention of dwarfing any of the prophets of the past, or of whittling down the eternal verity of their teachings. It can, in no wise, conflict with the spirit that animates their claims, nor does it seek to undermine the basis of any man's allegiance to their cause. It's interesting here in this first paragraph of the quote that Shoghi Effendi is saying that the Baha'i Faith does not seek to abrogate nor distort, nor belittle the value, and does not dwarf any prophets of the past. That it also does not seek to undermine the basis of any man's allegiance to their cause. It's interesting that when you begin to study the Baha'i Faith, what I believe we actually find is if there is any problem in how the Baha'i Faith sees previous messengers of God. Um, that really what is happening is that it is actually, if anything, an overinflation of their station. And this goes even for such individuals such as Krishna from the Bhagavad Gita, or Jesus Christ within the New Testament. That, in a sense, it is giving a fuller expression of the station of them, and I think we will see this in future videos related to Hinduism and Christianity. That it is something that is trying to actually state that the, the kernel, if you will, the seed of Judaism, was actually given greater life within Christianity. That our understanding of the divine and its relationship to humankind was actually expressed to a greater, de greater degree sorry, within the dispensation of Islam. And the same goes for the Baha'i Faith. It's not seeking to abrogate, belittle, or dwarf any, dwarf any prophets of the, fa of the past. Rather, it is actually expressing how they fit into a continually progressive revelation of God's will and desires for humankind. And I have to say that this is a claim that, as peculiar as one might see it on the surface, is not one that can be brushed off without investigation. It may not sound like what another individual believes, or what a person, you know, if you will, takes to immediately. But it is only through an investigation, 
the independent investigation of truth, one of the first teachings of the Baha'i Faith, then one can truly assess whether or not the claim is true. It's declared. Its primary purpose is to enable every adherent of these faiths to obtain a fuller understanding of the religion with which he stands identified and to acquire a clearer apprehension of its purpose. It is neither eclectic in the presentation of its truths, nor arrogant in the affirmation of its claims. Its teachings revolve around the fundamental principle that religious truth is not absolute, but relative. That divine revelation is progressive, not final. Unequivocally, and without the least reservation, it proclaims all established religions to be divine in origin, identical in their aims, complementary in their functions, continuous in their purpose, indispensable in their value to mankind. I absolutely love this section of the quote because it actually states that the Baha'i Faith's primary purpose is to enable every adherent of these faiths to obtain a fuller understanding of the religion with which he stands identified and to acquire a clearer apprehension of its purpose. And again, this isn't something that individuals within prior dispensations or prior religions, if you will, uh, should find odd from a, even a Jewish perspective. The religion of Moses would have given individuals who had been followers of Abraham or Noah a clear apprehension of the purpose of the original covenant. An expression, for example, within the Old Testament of the revelation given unto Isaiah or, I or Ezekiel or Micah was to enable an adherent of that tradition itself to have a deeper and more profound understanding of the religion with which they stood identified through a, if you will, a progressive revelation through Isaiah, Ezekiel, or Micah. And I think it's, uh, when I actually hear this, it's like I myself am a musician. So I might, for example, at the beginning of my study, study scales, and I study them in a very particular way, say from the lowest note to the highest note and back down. But it's actually when I learn more about music, and I actually understand a greater degree of that beautiful art, that I find actually a fuller understanding of the purpose of these things. If I'm studying mathematics, I begin, say, purely within a symbolic language when I'm very young. And yet as I grow and develop within my mathematical world, within the mathematical discourses and sciences, I find actually how they can be applied for example, to the economy, or I find out how they can be applied to physics, I find out how they can be applied to chemistry, and it is through such things that I obtain a fuller understanding of the original mathematical structures, or in the musical case of the scale. Uh, for example, within the martial arts, I might have a specific drill that I'm actually moving through. Yet it is only through a greater picture that I find out how that drill particularly fits into a greater picture. And I think it's the same with religion. As I said, even for the Jewish individual, from a Christian perspective, it is once again the same thing. That yes, there were revelations sent unto Abraham, Moses, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah. And yet it is only through Christianity that actually one understands and becomes better acquainted with the Jewish scriptures and has a fuller understanding of what their purpose was, what the actual intention was. Um, the same goes for a Muslim. They actually perceive that it is actually through the Quran that they understand more about the dispensation of Jesus Christ, what it was for. I was creating a wider community a community of humankind that will embrace greater and greater degrees of expressions of God's will for humankind. It's that we understand in so many cases that through the stages of learning and even prior moral understanding, that it is actually once we understand a larger picture of the world that we come to see how this teaching of, say, even honesty within the moral world or compassion has so many more expressions and so many other ways to relate to humankind, whether it be honesty and compassion or justice, we see it being fulfilled and manifested in a greater degree. And the same thing goes when you're teaching any individual 
anything, really. <laughs> you start with the basics, you give them an understanding, and then in a sense you place that within the context of a larger vision of how that relates to the rest of their world. I even suggested before that it is even through uh, the understanding of Buddhism. And when a Buddhist looks at the Hindu scriptures, they believe they understand more deeply the role or the position, for example, of the Hindu pantheon, more about their nature and relationship to the divine world, their relationship to samsara, the role they play within one's ascent to nirvana, or through the stages of the base of infinite space of nothingness, of neither perception or non-perception, these different stages that appear within the Hindu, or sorry, within the Buddhist scriptures. And I think it's the same once again. It is through Buddhism that I understand Hinduism. Now, of course, it is through Hinduism that I understand Buddhism, because that is the context that it's placed within. And again, this will take further study within Buddhism and Hinduism to show, but that it really is meeting people where they are, helping them to understand the nature of the divine realm and the sacred, and enabling them to actually really get a handle on it, and then evolving that understanding. And this is the same whether it be in teaching someone martial arts, sciences, mathematics, music, really anything. All the prophets of God, asserts Baha'u'llah in the Kitab Igan, abide in the same tabernacle, soar in the same heaven, are seated upon the same throne, utter the same speech, and proclaim the same faith. From the beginning that hath no beginning, these exponents of the unity of God and channels of his, of his incessant utterance have shed the light of the invisible beauty upon mankind, and will continue, to the end that hath no end, to vouchsafe fresh revelations of his might and additional experiences of his inconceivable glory. To contend that any particular religion is final, that all revelation is ended, that the portals of divine mercy are closed, that from the day springs of eternal holiness no sun shall rise again, that the ocean of everlasting bounty is forever stilled, and that out of the tabernacle of ancient glory the messengers of God have ceased to be made manifest would indeed be nothing less than sheer blasphemy. In this passage, the Shoghi Effendi is quoting Baha'u'llah, and he is stating that from a Baha'i perspective, we see all the prophets of God abiding in the same tabernacle, soaring in the same heaven, seated upon the same throne. That the Word of God, or the will of God, termed the Logos, for example, within the New Testament, is actually manifested through various vehicles, various expressions, various, the Baha'i term is, manifestations, upon the plane of history to tell the story of the sacred, to share with humankind the beauty of the divine friend of ultimate reality, and that this is an eternal covenant between God and humankind started at the beginning of human consciousness, and that these expressions from God will never end. Quote, to contend that any particular religion is final, and I will end that section of the quote, would indeed be nothing less than sheer blasphemy. There's actually very, very few times <laughs> that the, the Baha'i writings ever use this term, but it is that it is going directly against the very nature of what God is. That there is a very large difference between the belief that God will not, as opposed to cannot, reveal his attributes and spread his fragrance unto humankind. That all the, and it's, sorry, it's important to note that all religions actually proclaim a coming revelation, another expression of God's will unto humankind. It's not a matter of whether or not he will, it's rather how he will do so. For example, if it is going to be completely obvious, as many, for example, Christians and Muslims might believe, 
or even Buddhists or Hindus might believe, or whether it's something that actually will necessitate the intellectual, spiritual, and emotional and moral investigation of the adherents to see whether or not this, for example, the Baha'i Faith, is one of those expressions of the Divine Will unto humankind. They differ, explains Baha'u'llah in that same epistle, only in the intensity of their revelation and the comparative potency of their light. And this, not by reason of any inherent incapacity of any one of them to reveal in a fuller measure the glory of the message with which he has been entrusted, but rather because of the immaturity and unpreparedness of the age he lived in to apprehend and absorb the full potentialities latent in that faith. Know of a certainty, explains Baha'u'llah, that in every dispensation the light of divine revelation has been vouchsafed to men in direct proportion to their spiritual capacity. Consider the sun, how feeble its rays the moment it appears above the horizon, how gradually its warmth and potency increase as it approaches its zenith, enabling, meanwhile, all created things to adapt themselves to the growing intensity of its light, how steady it declines until it reaches its setting point. Were it, all of a sudden, to manifest the energies latent within it, it would, no doubt, cause injury to all created things. In like manner, if the Sun of Truth were suddenly to reveal, at the earliest stages of its manifestation, the full measure of the potencies which the providence of the Almighty has bestowed upon it, the earth of human understanding would waste away and be consumed. For men's hearts would neither sustain the intensity of its revelation, nor be able to mirror forth the radiance of its light. Dismayed and overpowered, they would cease to exist. So in this quote, Baha'u'llah says, and again unequivocally, that the differences that we find amongst the religions of God is that only in their intensity of the revelation and the comparative potency of their light. That it is not because of some, quote, inherent capacity any one of them might lack or possess, but rather because, again, quote, of the immaturity and unpreparedness of the age in which he, the manifestation of God, lived in to apprehend and absorb the full potentialities latent in that faith. That the light of divine revelation has been vouchsafed to men in direct proportion to their spiritual capacity. It is not that actually that which, for example, from a Baha'i perspective, is expressed within the teachings of the Baha'i faith is because of some essential inherent uh, superiority of Baha'u'llah or the Bab, the forerunner of the Baha'i faith, but rather it is the, the, the nature of the divine educator themselves in meeting humankind at the level of their spiritual, moral, and social evolution and seeking to lift them to the degree possible. And this again is the exact same thing that any teacher must do. They must reach out, find, and if you will, diagnose like a divine physician the degree of understanding and capacity of their patient or their student and actually raise them up. To actually share with an individual or a group of people something that is far beyond their capacity would actually be a poor educator or a poor physician. But it's not in the nature of, say, a teacher. For example, my wife is a teacher and she teaches kindergarten. It's not that she couldn't teach grade seven or she couldn't study and express things at the degree, if you will, of college or university. It's that her job is to meet these individuals where they are at and seek to raise them up so that the next teacher can actually spread that further. So the coming of, for example, Baha'u'llah is not a diminution, a lessening of the station or dwarfing of a station of the Prophet Muhammad, 
any more than the Prophet Muhammad sought to dwarf or belittle the station of Jesus Christ. Nor, for that example, Christ of Moses nor Moses of Abraham. It is for this reason, and this reason only, that those who have recognized the light of God in this age claim no finality for the revelation with which they stand identified, nor arrogate to the faith they have embraced powers and attributes intrinsic, intrinsically superior to or essentially different from those which have characterized any of the religious systems that preceded it. The revelation of which I am the bearer, Baha'u'llah explicitly declares, is adapted to humanity's spiritual receptiveness and capacity. Otherwise, the light that shines within me can neither wax nor wane. Whatever I manifest is nothing more or less than the measure of the divine glory which God has bidden me reveal. If the light that is now streaming forth upon an increasingly responsive humanity with a radiance that bids fair to eclipse the splendor of such triumphs as the forces of religion have achieved in days past, if the signs and tokens which proclaimed its advent have been, in many respects, unique in the annals of past revelations, if its votaries have evinced traits and qualities unexampled in the spiritual history of mankind, these should be attributed not to a superior merit which the faith of Baha'u'llah as a revelation isolated and alien from any previous dispensation might possess, but rather should be viewed and explained as the inevitable outcome of the forces that have made of this present age an age infinitely more advanced, more receptive, and more insistent to receive an ampler measure of divine guidance than has hitherto been vouchsafed to mankind. So in this passage, again, it is not to arrogate to the faith they have embraced powers intrinsically superior. No Baha'i should actually believe that the Baha'i faith, or Baha'u'llah, or the Bab, actually has intrinsically superior capacities compared to that of Abraham, or that of Moses, or that of Jesus or the Prophet Muhammad, but rather that it is adapted to human spiritual receptiveness and capacity, as we were speaking earlier, and that if it, quote, bids fair to eclipse the splendor of such triumphs as the forces of religion have achieved in the past, it these should be attributed not to a superior merit which the faith of Baha'u'llah might possess, but rather as the, quote, inevitable outcome of the forces that have made of this present age an age infinitely more advanced, more receptive, and more insistent to receive an ampler measure of divine guidance. So once again, it is not a lessening or dwarfing of prophets of the past or of revelations of the past, something each adherent of any prior faith should be able to understand. Even within, for example, as I gave the example with uh, Judaism in the past, um, even when we look at Hinduism, did or did not, from a Hindu perspective, Brahman or manifest himself in the form of Vishnu in the temple of Krishna or Rama previously? <laughs> Sorry. Yes, the divine has actually revealed itself in many ways. And has that actual revelation unto humankind actually been increasing and giving us a richer picture? I would argue that in Hinduism it does. That actually when we move from Vedic understandings to an understanding of the Upanishads or the Gita, we get a fuller, fuller understanding of the divine. Does that mean that the Vedas themselves are actually dwarfed, belittled, or rejected? No, it's actually... That was the earlier stage of the education of the peoples in that region of the world. And that the revelation that was sent unto them was actually suited to their capacity as any educator would unto their students. Follow thou the way of thy Lord, and say not that which the ears cannot bear to hear. For such speech is like luscious food given to small children. 
however palatable, rare and rich the food may be. It cannot be assimilated by the digestive organs of a suckling child. Therefore, unto everyone who hath a right, let his settled measure be given. Not everything that a man knoweth can be disclosed, nor can everything that he can disclose be regarded as timely, nor can every timely utterance be considered as suited to the capacity of those who hear it. Such is the consummate wisdom to be observed in thy pursuits. Be not oblivious thereof, if thou wishest to be a man of action under all conditions. First diagnose a disease and identify the malady, then prescribe the remedy, for such is the perfect method of the skillful physician. So in this quote, uh, which is from the selections of the writings of Abdu'l-Baha, also includes a quote, he is actually quoting Baha'u'llah in the second section. And he gives this example of giving food to a child which they cannot digest. Giving something to a person that they cannot properly process. And then he quotes uh, Baha'u'llah. Not everything a man knoweth can be disclosed, nor can everything that he disclosed be regarded as timely, nor considered suited to the capacity of those who hear it. Once again, this notion of health or education. And in each case, that that which has to be given is what is suited to the capacity of the individual or group that one is communicating with, or feeding, or giving a remedy unto. And we actually hear passages like this, for example, in the New Testament, that actually we cannot give meat to a child, right? That we actually, there are things that we cannot yet bear to hear, but will be revealed in the future. Um, and this was in no way in the statements of Jesus Christ, or any of the prophets of the past, a statement that they couldn't reveal it, but rather that it was not timely, or suited to the capacity of those who were listening. So the next quote is actually a longer quote, once again from the World Order of Baha'u'llah, which we will take in sections. Nor does the Baha'i Revelation, claiming as it does to be the culmination of a prophetic cycle and the fulfillment of the promise of all ages, attempt, under any circumstances, to invalidate those first and everlasting principles that animate and underlie the religion that had preceded it. The God-given authority vested in each one of them, it admits and establishes as its firmest and ultimate basis. So here Shoghi Effendi says that the Baha'i Revelation does not attempt to invalidate those first and everlasting principles that animate and underlie the religions that have preceded it. That it is not trying to take away the fundamental essential capacities and expressions of humankind's relationship with the divine or his finding of the sacred beloved. It regards them in no other light except as different stages in the eternal history and constant evolution of one religion, divine and indivisible, of which it itself forms but an integral part. It neither seeks to obscure their divine origin, nor to dwarf the admitted magnitude of their colossal achievements. It can countenance no attempt that seeks to distort their features, or to stullify the truths which they instill. So the Baha'i Faith views prior religions as, quote, different stages in the eternal history and constant evolution of one religion. This is um, a facet of the Baha'i faith that often isn't properly understood. Uh, Baha'is, in my understanding, um, the Baha'i faith does not see that there are many, many religions on the face of our earth. It sees them as chapters or expressions of one fundamental religion, which has been, as if you will, a divine gardener, cultivating all the different regions of one property, if you will, to create them into one exquisite garden, into one exquisite, beautiful, flowering place. A fragrant and luscious and nutritious place. And that it seeks to neither, to quote, to obscure their divine origin, nor to dwarf, the admitted magnitude of their colossal achievements. 
So the Baha'i faith really seeks not only to recognize the, quote, colossal achievements that these previous revelations have actually achieved, but even to actually bring them to a fuller expression by placing them within their historical, social, and intellectual context. To really see that while we might see a stage as backward, viewing it from a much later stage, if we see it within its context, we can find that it is actually rather pivotal, and in fact vital to humankind's development. We return again to the same notion that you know, simple mathematics, multiplication, you know what I mean? Subtraction, addition, right? These things may seem to someone who has actually advanced in mathematics as simple, not, not worthy of attention. And they aren't in some cases when you yourself are a mathematician or you're working within physics, but they are vital to your understanding of where you stand now. They are pivotal to the development of the human mind. Its teachings do not deviate a hairbreadth from the verities they enshrine, nor does the weight of its message detract one jot or one tittle from the influence they exert or the loyalty they inspire. Here the Guardian states that the Bifaith's teachings do not deviate a hair's breadth from the verities they enshrine, they do not detract from their message, or from the influence they exert, or the loyalty they inspire. And this is often hard to see, because an individual from a, for example, Jewish perspective, sees a Christian as actually abandoning, turning away from, and if you will, even disparaging Moses. But from a Christian perspective, you know, they are actually seeing the true fruit of what Moses had actually laid down. And again, from a Jewish perspective, to actually have followed Isaiah or Ezekiel, um, to do so would be to see what it was that Moses was doing, or returning us back to the true expression of the Mosaic dispensation. And even so, the loyalty that they inspire is actually extended. Um, I would argue from a Christian perspective, and actually Abdu Baha makes this argument in uh, Promulgation of Universal Peace, where actually the teachings of Moses, his name and his influence, has been spread throughout the world to a, greater, to a greater degree by Jesus than by the Jewish population themselves. And I would argue the same principle actually goes for Islam and Christianity and Judaism, that it has actually been a greater expression, a greater expanse of the very name of Jesus Christ. Even if one still contends that they are irreconcilable, that name was voiced throughout the rest of the world, not by Christian missionaries, but rather by Muslims. Far from aiming at the overthrow of the spiritual foundation of the world's religious systems, it's avowed its unalterable purpose is to widen their basis, to restate their fundamentals, to reconcile their aims, to reinvigorate their life, to demonstrate their oneness, to restore the pristine purity of their teachings, to coordinate their functions, and to assist in the realization of their highest aspirations. These divinely revealed religions, as a close observer has graphically expressed it, are doomed not to die, but to be reborn. Does not the child succumb in the youth, and the youth in the man? Yet neither child nor youth perishes. There is so much stated in this quote, or this section of the quote, by the Guardian. He states that the Baha'i Faith is to widen the basis of previous revelations, to restate their fundamentals, reconcile their aims, reinvigorate their life, demonstrate their oneness, restore the pristine purity, coordinate their functions, and assist in the realization of their highest aspirations. That's a mouthful. <laughs> There's a, a great deal to actually be talked about in this quote. Um, what we see is that the Baha'i faith, true or not, <laughs> is actually stating that it is attempting to restate the fundamental sacred principles of prior dispensations. 
trying to reconcile their aims by seeing them in a larger context, to reinvigorate their life and bring people back to understand the true beauty of actually these dispensations, these expressions and manifestations of God's will, by showing how they played a role in the continuing development and raising up of humankind. It is even to restore their pristine purity and coordinate their functions and assist in the realization of their aims. I believe that we can see when we truly look at these revelations of God, these manifestations of the will and love of the Divine Friend, that much of the original teachings and the original purpose has become obscured through the dust of history. Through contentious and often divisive battles within the revelations, for example, within Christian denominations or sects, or Islamic legal schools, or Islamic sects and denominations, same with Buddhist and Hindu. In fact, this part, as we will return to this in the future, is something that can't actually be denied by any adherent of any of these faiths, because there is such a difference in how these different denominations and sects really see this revelation. That the Baha'i faith is to at one, restate their pristine teachings, return to their fundamentals, place them in their context, and enable us to have a deeper understanding of how one revelation was actually intimately interconnected with another, and thus widen their basis, expand the scope of one's loyalty, instead of reducing or removing one's loyalty and adoration for a specific revelation. I would even suggest as well that even these debates and sometimes divisions that occurred within, say, the Christian Church or the Islamic community, that it's important to, even in this front, empathize and understand the individuals and the players involved. That at times, as uh, really as sad as some of these were, that there were players who were attempting, to the best of their ability, to save the faith that they saw as truly beautiful, sacred, and divine. At times, these might have been far more extreme than they ever should have been. Um, and I think that by going back and even understanding the different expressions of creeds and dogmas, we can find light through the clouds. They who are the luminaries of truth and the mirrors reflecting the light of divine unity Baha'u'llah explains in the Kitab Yagon. In whatever age and cycle they are sent down from their invisible habitations of ancient glory unto this world to educate the souls of men and endue with grace all created things, are invariably endowed with an all-compelling power and invested with invincible sovereignty. These sanctified mirrors, these day springs of ancient glory, are one and all the exponents on earth of him who is the central orb of the universe, its, its essence and ultimate purpose. From him proceed their knowledge and power. From him is derived their sovereignty. The beauty of their countenance is but a reflection of his image, and their revelation a sign of his deathless glory. Through them is transmitted a grace that is infinite, and by them is revealed the light that can never fade. Human tongue can never be fittingly sing their praise, and human speech can never unfold their mystery. Inasmuch as these birds of the celestial throne, he adds, are all sent down from the heaven of the will of God, and as they all arise to proclaim his irresistible face, they therefore are regarded as one soul, and the same person. They all abide in the same tabernacle, soar in the same heaven, are seated upon the same throne, utter the same speech, and proclaim the same face. They only differ in the intensity of their revelation and the comparative potency of their light. That a certain attribute of God hath not been outwardly manifested by these essences of detachment, doth in no wise imply that they who are the daysprings of God's attributes 
and the treasuries of his holy names did not actually possess it. In this section of the quote from the World Order of Baha'u'llah, Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of the Baha'i faith, uh, quotes Baha'u'llah in the text. And there are several aspects of it I think really need to be taken note of. One is this section where it says, when speaking of these sanctified mirrors, these day springs of ancient glory, are one and all the exponents on earth of him who is the central orb of the universe, its essence and ultimate purpose. That it continues, the beauty of their countenance is but a reflection of his image and their revelation a sign of his deathless glory. Very often within interfaith dialogue, it is seen that from a Baha'i perspective, we actually believe in someone other than Jesus. Or for example, someone other than Krishna, or other than the Buddha. And yet, true or not, <laughs> that's for the investigation, the quotes within the Baha'i faith state that each of these are exponents, or a countenance of, a reflection of, this one central orb. And I believe when we look, for example, again in the New Testament, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, that it is actually the Word of God that is actually being reflected in the image of these physical temples. As a quick aside, um, when you read actually the beginning of the Gospel of John in the New Testament, you see that in the beginning was the Word, but Jesus Christ, the physical temple and expression of divinity within the New Testament, in the dispensation of Christ, was actually obviously far, far after. <laughs> Yet that being was seen as a reflection of his deathless glory, an image, their revelation, a sign of him. So what a Baha'i, in my understanding, sees as a manifestation of God is really an expression, a historical expression and communication of the divine being to humankind in the form of a human temple. This is why Baha'u'llah adds, all are sent down from the heaven of the will of God, and they all arise to proclaim his irresistible faith. They therefore are regarded as one soul and the same person. This is why, as we have seen previously, that if a certain attribute is manifested in one of these divine revelations, if a certain facet of the divine nature, or even a certain facet of that divine being, the reality of a manifestation of God, is only outwardly expressed in that dispensation, that it, quote, doth in no wise imply that they who are the day springs of God's attributes and the treasuries of his holy names did not actually possess it. This again relates to the nature of a teacher. If I am teaching an individual my one of my martial arts, for example, when I'm doing so, when I'm teaching them something very fundamental, it doesn't mean I don't possess what I teach to my advanced students. If my music teacher is teaching me something, and it is a certain facet of the musical, wonderful world of music, it doesn't mean that he doesn't possess what another teacher would teach me. It simply means that that is not the time nor place for the expression of that quality. And I think as well, we can understand that to many people in our own lives, we are different people. We share different aspects of ourself. To those who are intimate and those who stay around us, they get to see a lot more of who we are. And again, this is a decent analogy for how I as a Baha'i see the Baha'i revelation if you will, the eternal covenant between God and humankind. It's that if you had been around for millennia and had actually stayed with the light of God's communication, as opposed to the lamp, 
which is the physical expression of it, you would come to know much more the beauty of that divine being, because it is as if he has sent you letter after letter after letter. I know myself once when I asked my own teacher of the Baha'i Faith, um, what is your scripture? Like, well, like, where is Baha'i scripture? And I'll never forget this, actually, because he brought out uh, the Bible. And he put it down and he said, uh, do you realize that this is not just one book? I was raised in a Catholic family, so I said, well, of course I do. It's many, many books. And he said, and it is seen as being two dispensations, if you will, that of Moses and that of Jesus Christ. I said, yeah, you know, the Old Testament and the New Testament as said by Christians. And he said, but there's actually book after book after book in here. I said, yeah, and they're just, yeah, I guess they're bound together. But then he brought out the Quran, the writings of the Buddha. He brought out Hindu writings. And he also brought out the writings of the Bab and Baha'u'llah. That when I was sitting there, I was thinking, well, one, that's just a massive corpus. But also, it was this image of love letters. Um, the idea that if my beloved had actually shared with me or my parent had shared with me a series of letters expressing themselves to me, that if I only read one of them, I would actually miss out a great deal on the real richness of the character of my beloved. And I would offer this as an analogy for how we can see the different divine religions of humankind's collective spiritual history. It should also be borne in mind that Great as it is, as is the power manifested by this revelation, and however vast the range of the dispensation its author has inaugurated, it emphatically repudiates the claim to be regarded as the final revelation of God's will and purpose for mankind. To hold such a conception of its character and functions would be tantamount to a betrayal of its cause and a denial of its truth. It must necessarily conflict with the fundamental principle which constitutes the bedrock of Baha'i belief. The principle that religious truth is not absolute but relative, that divine revelation is orderly, continuous, and progressive, and not spasmodic or final. Indeed, the categorical rejection by the followers of the faith of Baha'u'llah of the claim to fin finality which any religious system inaugurated by the prophets of the past may advance, is as clear and emphatic as their own refusal to claim that same finality for the revelation with which they stand identified. To believe that all revelation is ended, that the portals of divine mercy are closed, that from the day springs of eternal holiness no sun shall rise again, that the ocean of everlasting bounty is forever stilled, and that out of the tabernacle of ancient glory the messengers of God have ceased to be made manifest, must constitute in the eyes of every follower of the faith a grave and an inexcusable departure from one of its most cherished and fundamental principles. In here, in this quote, Shoghi Effendi, again, in the world order of Baha'u'llah, states that the Baha'i faith, quote, repudiates the claim to be regarded as the final revelation of God's will and purpose for mankind. It is not that Baha'u'llah is the end. From a Baha'i perspective, there won't be an end. As long as there are conscious beings who can actually seek out the mysteries of the universe, delve into moral realities, and can have a relationship with their Creator, there is revelations of God. That, as well, to state this would be, quote, tantamount to a betrayal of its cause and a denial of its truth. Then it states that the fundamental principle which constitutes the bedrock of Baha'i belief, the be principle that religious truth is not absolute but relative, the divine revelation is orderly, continuous, and progressive, not spasmodic and final. And I think that, as he says, it would be 
an inexcusable departure from one of its most cherished and fundamental principles. Now then, the idea, again from my understanding, um, that the Baha'i faith teaches that spiritual truth is relative, not final, is not relativism. It's not actually stating that any individual who has any perspective is therefore necessarily true. No, it's really in the context of many of the analogies that we have already looked at. That when an individual is actually sharing knowledge with another, be they a teacher of music, mathematics, science, language, linguistics, history, and any of these, it is that we are having an expression of a series of truths to the degree and capacity of the student themselves. That mathematical truths taught in the beginning, which may have to be understood more fully, um, does not mean that while it is relative and progressive, it does not mean that former truths are false. It does not mean that these are partial truths, no, sorry, that does not mean that they are relative truths, but they can at times be partial expressions of a greater truth, and that they are consecutive, that there is a development not spasmodic and not final, that humankind has been under the tutelage of one divine being that has expressed itself unto humankind in various different ways in trying to slowly meet cultures and communities and individuals at the stage that they are at and bring them up together so that if as they came closer to the source, they could be united. Another analogy could be used for this um, relative and progressive versus absolute and spasmodic is the idea of the difference between someone coming up and you're building a building and saying that anything is a building. <laughs> Um, by this I mean, when one is laying the foundations of a building, it is for there to be erected further stages on it in a progressive degree, a further, all the way to its full and complete ornamentation, which Baha'is believe will never happen. <laughs> um, rather than saying, I'm laying the foundations, and a person comes up and asks me and says, well, what are you doing? And I say, well, I'm actually, this is a building, or we're making, this is a house. Right? And then a person looking over their garden and saying, yes, I have a house too. That would be a notion of relativism rather as relative. Relative to its time, relative to its place, and relative to the capacity of an individual. Far from wishing to add to the number of the religious systems whose conflicting loyalties have for so many generations disturbed the peace of mankind, this faith is instilling into each of its adherents a new love for and a genuine appreciation of the, un of the unity underlying the various religions represented within its pale. In the first section of this quote, Shoghi Effendi says, We are not wishing to add to the number of the religious systems, um, but rather instilling in the adherents a new love for genuine appreciation of, the, appreciation of the unity underlying the various religions represented within its pale. That from a Baha'i's perspective, um, there is not, again, not a multiplicity of religions, but a multiplicity of letters from one's creator, enabling individuals and communities to understand a facet if you will, of the divine being. This again can be understood. Um, how else would a Hindu understand the expression through the Vedas, through, for example, the Upanishads, through things like the Gita or the Puranas, rather than but additional expressions of the divine? How else would a Jewish individual understand the Old Testament, a collection of numerous books? other than seeing them as not adding another religion or another revelation, but seeing them as a continuous expression over time to the relative degree and understanding of the individuals, a remedy tailored to their time and place. The same goes for a Christian or a Muslim. 
Again, um, even within Islam, which many people believe refutes the authenticity of the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, it does not. And I ask you to please actually look at the video on this site about the authenticity of the Bible in the Old Testament, or the, the Tanakh, um, from the Quran itself. It really is seeing an interdependence of these different revelations, not a diminution of any one given faith. That really when we actually look at the Baha'i writings, it is usually, if one really becomes familiar with the writings, it is an apparent over-exaltation of the station of these religions, from both the perspectives of the adherents and also the secular world, because the Baha'i faith is seeing them as the founders of these faiths, as being seemingly greater than many of the adherents themselves, but also seeing these revelations as beautiful and exquisite, because we're seeing them as placed within the historical context and social context in which they were revealed. These are, in the end, the various stages of one educator, the various cultivations and prunings of one divine gardener. While preserving their patriotism and safeguarding their lesser loyalties, it has made them lovers of mankind and the determined upholders of its best and truest interests. While maintaining intact their belief in the divine origin of their respective religions, it has enabled them to visualize the underlying purpose of these religions, to discover their merits, to recognize their sequence, their interdependence, their wholeness and unity, and to acknowledge the bond that vitally links them to itself. This universal, this transcending love which the followers of the Baha'i Faith feel for their fellow men, of whatever race, creed, class, or nation, is neither mysterious nor can it be said to have been artificially sim stimulated. It is both spontaneous and genuine. They whose hearts are warmed by the energizing influence of God's creative love cherish his creatures for his sake, and recognize in every human face a sign of his reflected glory. Though loyal to their respective governments, though profoundly interested in anything that affects their security and welfare, though anxious to share in whatever promotes their best interests, the faith with which the followers of Baha'u'llah stand identified is one which they firmly believe God has raised high above the storms, the divisions, and controversies of the political arena. Their faith they conceive to be essentially non-political, supranational in character, rigidly non-partisan, and entirely dissociated from nationalistic ambitions, pursuits, and purposes. Such a faith knows no division of class or of party. It subordinates, without hesitation or equivocation, every particularistic interest, be it personal, regional, or national, to the paramount interests of humanity, firmly convinced that in a world of interdependent peoples and nations, the advantage of the part is best to be reached by the advantage of the whole and that no abiding benefit can be conferred upon the component parts if the general interests of the entity itself are ignored or neglected. Their faith, Baha'is firmly believe, is moreover undenominational, non-sectarian, and wholly divorced from every ecclesiastical system, whatever its form, origin, or activities. No ecclesiastical organization, with its creeds, its traditions, its limitations, and exclusive outlook, can be said, as is the case with all existing political factions, parties, systems, and programs, to conform, in all its aspects, to the cardinal tenets of Baha'i belief, to some of the principles and ideals animating political and ecclesiastical institutions 
Every conscientious follower of the faith of Baha'u'llah can, no doubt, readily subscribe. With none of these institutions, however, can he identify himself, nor can he unreservedly endorse the creeds, the principles, and programs on which they are based. I included the section of this quote regarding politics because I believe it's an analogy for how Baha'is see the unity of religion just as they see the unity of the political sphere. In the second section, and please see uh, the political deepening here on Bridging Beliefs on Baha'i Politics, it states that the Baha'i faith is undenominational, non-sectarian, divorced from every ecclesiastical system because all Baha'i representatives are actually elected in a universal suffrage. It states that no ecclesiastical organization with its trades, creeds, traditions, limitations, and exclusive outlook can be said, as is the case with all existing political factions, party systems, and programs, to conform to the cardinal tenets of the Baha'i Faith. Um, it's stating that just as in the political realm, a Baha'i does not weigh in on um, whether it be conservative or liberal, or a perspective of, say, the Democratic Party or the Reform Party, that it is actually truly representing what a Baha'i believes. But actually, the Baha'i faith, from my understanding, can actually see so many actual, if you will, beautiful gems within each of these traditions. Oftentimes, again speaking for myself, I see facets of Catholic theology or Catholic doctrine as beautiful. I see aspects of Protestantism as beautiful. I see certain aspects of the theology of the Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox Church as exquisite. Yet the Baha'i Faith does not actually conform particularly to any of them. So it's the same in the both the political and religious sphere. With none of these institutions, the quote ends, However, can he identify himself, nor can he unreservedly endorse the creeds, the principles, and programs on which they are based? I might myself be able to understand why at a certain stage of humanity, the, the institute of even a hereditary priesthood might have actually been a useful social institution for carrying forth the intellectual and scribal arts. But to see it as actually tailored for the day in which we live, I cannot agree. Um, we do not try to actually brush away all these things, but seek to understand, in our view, what has been within its social context. What we're trying to do is to understand not simply what the Baha'i Faith is saying in this day, but because it is to enable the adherent of each faith to understand the fundamental purpose and have a deeper devotion for the religion with which they stand identified, a previous quote from the Guardian, that we're trying to understand what has been revealed in this day in the context of the familiar. That we're trying to see what really the purpose of these revelations of God to humankind were truly, truly for. And it's just that at times, if we take them out of their societal context, if we take them out of their social context, we're trying to use categories that don't properly apply. It's like trying to understand, if you will, a jellyfish through the categories of mammal and reptile. <laughs> we need a broader understanding of the biological world to see how they relate and even to see, if you will, their common ancestors. This section is a brief exploration of the topic of the independent investigation and the search for truth. Uh, please see the importance of knowledge, reason, and independent investigation in another deepening on this channel. Man must cut himself free from all prejudice and from the result of his own imagination, so that he may be able to search for truth unhindered. Truth is one in all religions, and by means of it the unity of the world can be realized. All the peoples have a fundamental belief in common. Being one, truth cannot be divided, and the difference that appeared to exist among the nations only result from their attachment to prejudice. If only men would search out truth, they would find themselves united. In this quote, Abdu'l-Bahá states, 
that all people have a fundamental belief in common. Truth cannot be divided. And then he states that the differences that appear to exist among the nations result from what? Our attachment to prejudice. And that if man would search out truth, we would find ourselves united. That we have to try to put aside our prejudice, as difficult as that might be, and search for truth unhindered. That he then states, truth is one in all religions, and by means of it the unity of the world can be realized. That it is only once we can see, just as racially, we have to be able to see that we are all human, or on gender lines that we are equal, we have to be able to see that all of these different expressions from the Divine Being are actually, through investigation, one. And then we can actually see the unity of humankind in this collective narrative that has actually been playing out over the millennia. God has conferred upon and added to man a distinctive power, the faculty of intellectual investigation into the secrets of creation, the acquisition of higher knowledge, the greatest virtue of which is scientific enlightenment. This endowment is the most praiseworthy power of man, for through its employment and exercise, the betterment of the human race is accomplished, the development of the virtues of mankind is made possible, and the spirit and mysteries of God become manifest. This is such a sweet quote. Um, it was something that, because while I was raised in a Catholic household, I became a secularist myself. Um, I always had this feeling, and I think most of us do, that humankind has this power of intellectual investigation. That we have the ability to seek out truth and find it, whatever that means. <laughs> and that Abdul Bahayur states that the greatest virtue of which is scientific enlightenment. That we can look into the secrets of creation and the acquisition of higher knowledge. That the betterment of the human race is only achieved through the spirit, through the investigation into the spirit and mysteries of God. That it is our intellectual capacity that enables us to draw these forth. And that these themselves have to be applied to the domain of religion. Now many people believe they actually have done so. But I would suggest there is a great, great difference between investigating something to prove that it's false and investigating something to see whether or not it is true. One begins with a decision that it is false and then looks for problems in order to refute it. The other one is trying to understand it on its own terms and see whether or not it is actually true. And this is actually what the Baha'i Faith is calling for. And if the possibility is never entertained, then the actual investigation has never occurred. We cannot come at a religion, even if it's Buddhism, and say, okay, well, I know without a doubt and refuse to consider anything other than the world is purely material and physical, and then actually go investigate Buddhism with the belief that it can't possibly be true, and then hunt for problems. This would not be an investigation, this would be a polemic, a war against another ideology. As it says in the, the book of Proverbs, before a downfall, the heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. To answer before listening, that is folly and shame. I love this quote from the book of Proverbs, from the Jewish scriptures, because it says, To answer before listening, that is a folly and a shame. Now, not only is it wrong and an error, but it's shameful to approach some claim some belief system and actually judge it before you have actually heard it. Which means to have never have actually considered that it is shameful. Why is it shameful? I would suggest because in the quote we were just reading from Abdu Baha, one of the most exquisite gems of humankind, in fact one of the things that truly defines us, is our ability to use our intellect and to actually investigate things without prejudice and to actually take that God-given gift and put it aside, or if you will, even to take that evolutionary given gift and to put it aside and refuse to utilize it 
in the investigation of religion or in the investigation of spirituality is shameful. This is why Abdu'l-Baha says the following. God has created man and endowed him with the power of reason, whereby he may arrive at valid conclusions. Therefore, man must endeavor in all things to investigate the fundamental reality. If he does not independently investigate, he has failed to utilize the talent God has bestowed upon him. So in this quote, as we were just saying, Abdu'l-Bah says, if he does not independently investigate, it, investigate, he has failed to utilize the talent God has bestowed upon him. Any individual who will not use a rational investigation of something has taken a part of what it is to be human and put it aside. And if we, again, I would suggest, if we immediately begin an investigation from the position that it is false, as opposed to actually seeing if it could be false or could be true, we have not investigated and then have placed aside this most precious gift. The primary, the most urgent requirement is the promotion of education. It is inconceivable that any nation should achieve prosperity and success unless this paramount, this fundamental concern is carried forward. The principal reason for the decline and fall of people is ignorance. The publication of high thoughts is the dynamic power in the arteries of life. It is the very soul of the world. Thoughts are a boundless sea, and the effects and varying conditions of existence are as the separate forms and individual limits of the waves. Not until the, soil, the sea boils up will the waves rise and scatter their pearls of knowledge on the shore of life. Thou, brother, art thy thought alone. The rest is the only thew and bone. Public opinion must be directed toward whatever is worthy of this day. And this is impossible except through the use of adequate arguments and the adducing of clear, comprehensive, and conclusive proofs. In this quote from The Secret of Divine Civilization, Abdu'l-Baha states that it is inconceivable that any nation could achieve prosperity and success, right, unless this paramount fundamental concern is carried forward, and that the principal reason for the decline and fall of peoples is ignorance. It is our unwillingness to investigate and our willingness to close our eyes to potential truths and leave this precious gift of God latent within us, our ability to investigate, and allow it to remain fallow. He even states in this quote that the publication of high thoughts is the very soul of the world. Abdu'l-Bah then quotes a poetic phrase, Thou brother art thy thought alone, the rest is only few and bone. And then states that it is impossible to direct public opinion, except through the use of adequate arguments and the adducing of clear, comprehensive, and conclusive proofs. Why does he quote this passage of poetry? It's because he's saying, if you were to truly estimate the nature of what you are as a human being, yes, you have a physical body, you have ligaments, you have arteries, and you have bone. Yet what you really are, what really defines humankind, is our ability to manifest the qualities and the virtues of God. Justice, compassion, honesty, mercy. Yet, we are our thought alone because that is through which even those are directed. Through choice. Through our own, the exercise of our own free will. And that if we are to put aside this very soul of the world, the publication of high thoughts, to put aside this God-given gift, we are actually choosing actively to be nothing more than a physical temple, to be nothing more, really, than an animal. Consider the people and nations of the earth today, and observe the same tenacious allegiance to ancestral belief. He whose father was a Zoroastrian is a Zoroastrian. He whose father was a Buddhist remains a Buddhist. The son of a Muslim continues a Muslim, and so on throughout. Why is this? 
because they are slaves and captives of mere imitation. They have not investigated the reality of religion and arrived at its fundamental and conclusions. The Jew, for instance, has not proved the validity of Moses by investigating reality. He is a Jew because his father was a Jew. He imitates the forms and beliefs of his fathers and ancestors. There is no thought or mention of reality. And so is it with the other peoples of religion. This is the purpose of our statement, that they worship the dawning point rather than the sun of reality itself. There is no doubt that very often the individual who was raised within a Christian household becomes a Christian. That raised in a Jewish family ends up being Jewish. Zoroastrian becomes a Zoroastrian. And this is a beautiful thing if, in fact, that choice of faith is done in accordance with the independent investigation of reality. If that individual has sought to understand the beauty of the tradition in which they have actually grown up and seeks independently for themselves to see whether or not it is true. Um, at the same time, in this first quote, Abdu'l-Bahá talks about how what, what he means by individuals worshipping the dawning point rather than the light itself is this imitation of one's forefathers, this imitation or becoming a captive of a prior tradition, rather than seeking out and proving the validity and the reality of that tradition for oneself and adopting it upon the basis of exploration and investigation. In this sense, one ends up actually merely investigating their own tradition, or worse, we would put, um, when an individual actually simply chooses the faith of their culture. There has been no investigation of the essential underlying basis of reality. One whose father was a Jew invariably proved to be a Jew. A Muslim was born of a Muslim. A Buddhist was a Buddhist because of the faith of his father before him, and so on. In brief, Religion was a heritage descending from father to son, ancestry to posterity, without investigation of the fundamental reality. Consequently, all religionists were veiled, obscured, and at variance. In this quote, Abdu'l-Bahá explains that this is actually how the veiling and obscuring of the original intent of religion comes about, that this is its primary vehicle. because. One grows up, for example, within the Christian faith, and hears of the fundamental creeds and doctrines, and instead of actually asking, well, are these actually what the New Testament taught? Is this truly what actually Jesus meant, or what Paul meant, or what Peter meant? They take this on as the standard filter through which they see the revelation of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. The same could be, for example, within the Islamic world. One grows up and they are taught that this is what Islam means, this is what the Quran says. And instead of investigating reality for themselves, they follow mere imitation and become captives of this tradition, and have not for themselves actually sought out the true beauty and wonder of, for example, the message of the Quran. Then in a sense there comes, as we will return to this in the future, there comes this insistence that this is what the Quran says, this is what Islam says. But in reality, in my understanding from the writings of Abdul Baha and the central figures of the Baha'i Faith, it is merely the repetition of the creeds, doctrine, doctrines and dogmas of the tradition that they have grown up within. Shall man, gifted with the power of reason, unthinkingly follow and adhere to dogma, creeds, and hereditary beliefs which will not bear the analysis of reason in this century of effulgent reality? Unquestionably this will not satisfy men of science, for when they find a premise or conclusion contrary to present standards of proof and without real foundation, they reject that which has been formally accepted as standard and correct and move forward from new foundations. In this quote, Abdu'l-Bahá, and I want to make this clear, is not actually 
criticizing the acceptance of actual traditions or creeds or dogmas. Rather, it is the unthinking acceptance. If I, for example, take on the research program, say, of Einsteinian physics, and I have done so by, so by actually investigating what it has to say, and seeing that it is true, when I adopt it, I adopt it as a truth that has actually been acquired through intellectual investigation. Very different when I actually just hear what is said and then parrot it back to another group of people. This would be becoming a captive of mere imitation. And I think that when we actually look at this, the, the Abdu'l-Bahá is asking that these dogmas and creeds and hereditary beliefs bear the analysis of reason. And then when someone actually encounters this and realizes through exploration, through the duty of investigation and the duty of inquiry, finds that they do not bear up to the analysis of reason, then it is in accordance with the intellectual honesty of an individual to put those creeds aside. Um, and again, we've just seen that actually Abdu'l-Bahá says that this is how, if you will, the momentum of dogmas and creeds begin to obscure the original intent and purpose of a divine revelation from God to humankind. The first teaching of Baha'u'llah is the investigation of reality. Man must seek reality himself, forsaking imitations and adherence to mere hereditary forms. As the nations of the world are following imitations in view of truth, and as imitations are many and various, differences of belief have been productive of strife and warfare. So long as these imitations remain, the oneness of the world of humanity is impossible. Therefore, we must investigate reality in order that by its light, the clouds and darkness may be dispelled. Reality is one reality. It does not admit multiplicity or division. If the nations of the world investigate reality, they will agree and become united. Now, in this quote, Abdu'l-Bahá is saying that the imitations are many and various. And this is in some sense an undeniable fact when we actually look, if you will, at the many and various sex and denominations within the different faith communities. That they actually have very different perspectives on, for example, what the Buddha taught, or what Hinduism really means, or what Christianity really stands for, what the New Testament is truly attempting to express. So they are many and various. And it's this that actually Abdu'l-Bahá is saying is actually the clouds that are actually truly veiling or obscuring the divine light. And the question is, how do we actually move through them? The following quote is also from the Promulgation of Universal Peace. And what we're going to do is actually uh, take it in chunks, as we have before, and look at how the different parts of it hang together. In divine questions, we must not depend entirely upon the heritage of tradition and form former human experience. Nay, rather, we must exercise reason, analyze and logically examine the facts presented so that confidence will be inspired and faith attained. Then, and then only, the reality of things will be revealed to us. Man should continue both these lines of research and investigation, so that all the human virtues, outer and inner, may become possible. The attainment of these virtues, both material and ideal, is conditioned upon intelligent investigation of reality, by which investigation the sublimity of man and his intellectual progress is accomplished. Forms must be set aside and renounced. Reality must be sought. We must discover for ourselves where and what reality is. In religious beliefs, nations and peoples today are imitators of ancestors and forefathers. If a man's father was a Christian, he himself is a Christian. A Buddhist is the son of a Buddhist, a Zoroastrian of a Zoroastrian. A Gentile or an idolater follows the religious footsteps of his father and ancestry. This is absolute imitation. The requirement in this day is that man must independently and impartially investigate 
every form of reality. So in the first part of this quote, Abdu'l-Baha is saying that actually both within the material realm, the physical sciences, and the ideal realm, the realm of the inner world, um, that one actually must truly seek out investigation, which is the sublimity of man. That we actually have to do all we can, and we all have our own limitations, but to do all that we can to actually seek out truth within the natural world and within our own hearts, our souls, and our minds. This is then paralleled to the investigation of religion itself. We actually have to be willing to put aside our own background, our own biases, and our own prior beliefs to actually truly investigate these different religions and to see whether or not they are true. And if we see truth within one faith, and we see that same light shining in another faith, we actually have to bow and ascend to it. This is why the next paragraph begins the great question appertaining to humanity is religion. The great question appertaining to humanity is religion. The first condition is that man must intelligently investigate its foundations. The second condition is that he must admit and acknowledge the oneness of the world of humanity. By this means, the attainment of true fellowship among mankind is assured and the alienation of races and individuals is prevented. Religion is one of the most powerful forces in human society. Billions of people throughout the world adhere to some faith tradition. And even outside of the traditional faith traditions, the beliefs, metaphysical, spiritual, no matter what they are, are really what actually moves society along. And they don't merely move the individuals, they actually move whole cultures. Entire cultures are actually, if you will, underpinned or undergirded by these belief systems. So to look out at the world and to try to understand it, it is actually a pipe dream if we do not seek to understand what is in the hearts and minds of the people that make up the cultures that we are studying. This is how my own study of comparative religion began. I wanted to understand my world. I wanted to understand politics and history and sociology. I also wanted to understand how people felt, what they thought about their world, how they saw themselves and their culture. And I realized very early on that actually in order to do so, I would actually have to study the classical traditions that undergird these societies. And here in this passage, in this whole section, Abdu'l-Baha is saying, that we actually intelligently investigate their foundations. What actually is the foundation of these faiths? Naturally, the foundations of these faiths are their actual scriptures. Yes, it is important to know how they have interacted upon the plane of history. It's important to know how people have seen them and how great minds have actually interacted with these texts. Yet the foundations of them first are their scriptures, and I would say the purport and intent of the scriptures. The second condition, Admit and acknowledge the oneness of the world of humanity. Why I, for myself, this was really important is because I wanted to be able to sit with anyone from anywhere and be able to know something of their tradition and their understanding of their scriptures to see what lay within the heart of these individuals. And I actually grant this also to agnosticism, atheism, New Age traditions, that I want to know how they think and how they feel. Because without this, I am somewhat blinded to the world in which I live. Here it says we must acknowledge the oneness of the world of humanity. And I think there's a deeper aspect that's actually running through this, which is that we have to realize that if there is a divine being, if there is a God, to me, and even in my younger years, that divine being would have actually communicated to all of humankind, would not have left many of his children without guidance. And to see, well, maybe, even if it's just a maybe, potentially in other cultures, the divine mind and the divine will has expressed itself in ways that were, as we've seen, tailored to these societies at the level they're at. And if such is the case, potentially they might look quite different than we would expect. But inside that lamp, we would say, find the same light. Inside the frame of that stranger mirror, if you will, we would see the same reflection of the sun. 
We now begin a section I call Secularism, Rationality, and Religion, Unity and Truth Tracking. Irreligion has conquered religion. The cause of the chaotic condition lies in the differences among the religions and finds its origin in the animosity and hatred existing between sects and denominations. Owing to strife and contention among themselves, the religions are being weakened and vanquished. If a commander is at variance with his army in the execution of military tactics, there is no doubt he will be defeated by the enemy. Today the religions are at a variance. Enmity, strife, and recrimination prevail among them. They refuse to associate, nay, rather, if necessary, they shed each other's blood. I love this quote because Abdu Baha is very clear. He's very clear in that he actually places the burden of responsibility for the waning of people's love for that which is religious upon the shoulders of religious people. That the animosity comes from the differences between the religions themselves. And further, that is the animosity and hatred existing between sects and denominations. It's important because no one who looks at history and sees many of the divisions that have actually occurred, for example, between Christianity and Islam, between Buddhism and Hinduism, between even Confucianism and Hinduism, no individual that sees these wars, these battles, these contentions, this strife, can honestly, I believe, fail to actually have sorrow well up in their heart, even anger the betrayal of, if you will, the moral sphere and covenants of peace that humankind should have, that are actually enjoined by these traditions. And I think in some sense, at least for me, how much worse when we actually look at an individual tradition, something like Christianity, and we see all these sects and denominations, again, like Sunni and Shia, for example, who have actually gone to war and killed each other because of a difference of understanding and interpretation of a holy book. This is something that I think individuals of any background have to come really to terms with and empathize with how really truly depressing this is, that you can have the same holy book, love the same divine manifestation of God, the expression of his will, be it in the temple of the prophet Muhammad, in the temple of the Buddha, or the temple of Jesus Christ, and then really come to blows and even murder, even if just pure anger and contention and hatred between individuals that actually love the same tradition. Imitation destroys the foundation of religion, extinguishes the spirituality of the human world, transforms heavenly illumination into darkness, and deprives man of the knowledge of God. It is the cause of the victory of materialism and infidelity over religion. It is the denial of divinity and the law of revelation. It refuses prophethood and rejects the kingdom of God. When materialists subject imitations to the intellectual analysis of reason, they find them to be mere superstitions. Therefore, they deny religion. It's so beautiful here because, once again, Abdul Baha is placing the burden of responsibility for why individuals of an atheistic, materialistic background reject religion upon the adherence of religion themselves. In a sense, there is a sort of, what do you expect? You have actually taken something that you have not investigated, uh, can't explain or express to someone else, and you're offering it to them to accept. They look at it, and if it actually appears to be foolishness, then it is just for them to look at it under the analysis of, of reason, and actually to deny it. This is very, very important. We see within the Baha'i Faith that this is actually why we have to produce arguments and intelligent expressions of religion to humankind so they can find solace not merely in their heart, but also within their mind. It's why 
Um, we see that we're to produce arguments and remove the apprehensions of people. Uh, please see the actual deepening on knowledge and learning uh, on this site. Now, we see that actually this imitation and this offering of superstition as truth, quote, deprives man of the knowledge of God. That we actually have to be willing to truly do our best to understand something, to offer it as a gift to a king. This is an analogy that's used within the Baha'i writings, to offer it as a priceless gift to a king. But when you offer a priceless gift to a king, you, you do your best to polish it, <laughs> to, to see its beauty for yourself and to refine it for when you hand it to the king or the queen. Now, there are in many traditions individuals who will say, for example, well, you just have to have faith. And in my understanding of the Baha'i writings, this is actually not what we're asking to do, nor is it the meaning of faith that we find either within the Baha'i writings, and I would actually argue, nor within the Christian scriptures or the Jewish scriptures. And there's an inherent problem here because if we actually say to someone, well, you just have to have faith, and say I'm saying this from a Christian tradition, and I say you just have, have to have faith, what if the individual responds, I do have faith. I have faith in Krishna. Because then, if you merely have to have faith, then you can have faith, for example, in the Buddha. You can have faith in the Prophet Muhammad. You can have faith in Noah. You can have faith in Zoroaster. There has to be a way that we can separate between these, if any of them are true. And it has to be able, in my belief, in my understanding of the Baha'i writings, to actually solace the heart and the mind of humankind. Now, these forms and rituals differ in the various churches and amongst the different sects, and even contradict one another, giving rise to discord, hatred, and disunion. The outcome of all this dissension is the belief of many cultured men that religion and science are contradictory terms, that religion needs no powers of reflection, and should in no wise be regulated by science, but must of necessity be opposed, the one to the other. The unfortunate effect of this is that science has drifted apart from religion, and religion has become a mere blind and more or less apathetic following of the precepts of certain religious teachers, who insist on their own favorite dogmas being accepted, even when they are contrary to science. This is foolishness, for it is quite evident that science is the light, and, being so, religion truly so-called does not oppose knowledge. Again, the second half of this quote I find so beautiful because it's saying that the outcome of all this dissension is that cultured men, individuals within society who are trying to use their mind and their heart, find that religion and science are contradictory. And it's really important here because it says that religion needs no powers of reflection. And this is something we're about to go into, is that the question that, well, if you're going to look at science, do you or do you not need to look at it rationally? And if rationally, does not it demand investigation? Does not it demand actually the sacrifice any investigative process actually demands? <laughs> this brings us here to the question of syncretism. And it is generally seen as the combination of different forms of belief or practice. And it's interesting because syncretism itself is actually always expressed in the pejorative, meaning to call, for example, a tradition uh, syncretistic is actually to say something about its, if you will, falsity, or that it is a mere patchwork, almost like a Frankenstein, where you're taking different beliefs and you're just sort of smashing them together or sewing them together to create something that never should have been. And I don't think this is the only meaning that we can actually have of syncretism. An example often given is the Greco-Roman world, where a Greek or a Roman encounters someone, say, from the Near East, and they see that they have a god, and this god actually has many of the attributes of their god. So suddenly they say, well, you know, our god is your god, and your god is our god. And it's seen as if it's, if you will, ignoring many of the differences, and once again, bringing these different traditions together in a way they never should have, right? 
really in a sense putting a round peg into a square hole. I think what's important to actually consider here is there's a difference between is something syncretistic or is it addressing prior truth claims. What if a movement, even in the case of the Greco-Roman world, is not actually stating, well, let's ignore the actual differences. Let's just completely ignore them and just crush them together because there are some sort of vague similarities, but is rather saying, well, wait a minute. Now let's actually take a look at your tradition and see really beyond, if you will, the idols themselves or the external outward forms, if really there is a heritage that we are both trying to communicate where there is some common origin lying behind the scenes and that we may be simply making differences that do not need to be stressed or even in some cases acknowledged. It's important to look at this. I myself have had individuals say to me that actually the Baha'i faith is a, a mere syncretism and it is expressed in the sense that like I said, you're taking things that should never be together and you're just sort of slapping them all together. They never really should be. Yet this is something that in the tradition of world religion could actually be accused of actually the vast majority of faiths. And that's something I actually want to look at now. In this case, we're going to start with Islam. And I want to read two quotes from the Quran. Those who believe in the Quran and those who follow the Jewish scriptures and the Christians and the Sabians, any who believe in Allah and the last day and work righteousness shall have their reward with their Lord. On them shall be no fear, nor shall they grieve. Say, O people of the book, ye have no ground to stand upon unless ye stand fast by the law, Torah, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come to you from your Lord. It is the revelation that cometh to thee from thy Lord, that increaseth in most of them their obstinate rebellion and blasphemy. But sorrow thou not over these people without faith. Those who believe in the Quran, those who follow the Jewish scriptures, and the Sabians and the Christians, any who believe in Allah and the last day and work righteousness, on them shall be no fear, nor shall they grieve. Syncretism is an accusation that has been thrown at Islam traditionally. In these two passages of the Quran, it's saying those who believe within the Jewish scriptures, the Quran, the Christians, and the Sabians, a very enigmatic reference. Um, and any of those who believe in the last day and work righteousness. There's another passage of the Quran where it says, those who believe in God and in the last day, and that he hath sent prophets. Now, in a sense, why isn't this a syncretism between Judaism, Christianity, Sabianism, and for example, let's say Zoroastrianism? Is it actually syncretism? Or is it in fact simply claiming that these were true prior expressions, which have a, if you will, an original source that is divine and that has been expressed in different ways throughout history in a progressive chain of messengers? Which one? Syncretism or addressing prior truth claims and the unity of religion. Christianity. Equally with Christianity, it has been claimed, and could be claimed, that on the surface this is a syncretic faith. Why would we say this? Uh, for one, because it actually addresses the claims of Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Moses, Noah, Abraham. There is a whole series of traditions that actually exist before Jesus Christ shows up. But in addition to this, and I'm just offering this for consideration, we see terms that are used within the Greek New Testament, not a Hebrew work, that actually come directly from Greek philosophy. For example, the Stoic concept of the Logos, a divine principle that lies beyond the world that is in some sense both the ground of what is true and what is good. Equally so within the New Testament, we see, for example, three figures show up at the cradle of Jesus Christ. 
the Three Magi, commonly referred to as the Three Wise Men. These individuals, it seems, are clearly, if one looks into it, Zoroastrian priests. The Magi themselves are an expression of Zoroastrianism, and then when we turn to Christianity, we see a series of doctrines which seem particularly Zoroastrian. <laughs> um, we see this idea of Satan, this ultimate dark force that is pulling against humankind towards that which is evil. But this, if you look into Zoroastrianism, which predates the Christian religion, looks like Ahriman or Angramanyu, this dark force that is actually tempting humankind. Equally as well, we find within the Buddhist scriptures the tempting of the Buddha by Mara the Destroyer, one who actually comes to the Buddha right when he is about to express his understanding of the Dharma and offers him power, offers him riches, so that he will not express the Dharma to the world. A very similar theme that which we actually find in the testing of Jesus Christ in the New Testament by Satan. And in both of these cases, Zoroastrianism and Buddhism both predate Christianity. Now the question is, is Christianity taking a syncretic form by attaching itself to Judaism, and then taking notions from Zoroastrianism into itself, even using a couple Zoroastrian players in the birth narrative of Jesus Christ? Is it actually bringing in themes from Buddhism, or is this actually archetypal motifs and expressions of prior truth claims, if you will, if you will, trails of crumbs that one could actually follow and find beauty elsewhere, the same light within different lamps? And again, from my own perspective, this is not a Stoic, Zoroastrian, Jewish syncretism. It is actually the revelation of God to humankind addressing many of these issues and trying to bring them into a synthesis to educate humankind, to raise them up to a new level where they can become one community and carry forward an ever advancing civilization. What about Judaism? <laughs> um, this is the same thing again. It's important to note, and we've seen this uh, <clears throat> previously, that the Bible itself, the Tanakh in this example, what the Christians call the Old Testament, is actually a series of books. It's not one book. It's dozens of them strung together. Is this syncretism? Is really someone guilty of just taking Isaiah and taking Ezekiel and taking the book of Jeremiah and, and grabbing Exodus and putting it together with Proverbs and Psalms? Is this syncretic, or is this actually because these are expressions of the divine will through time to humankind in an ever-expanding and unveiling of the divine friend? Equally so in this case, because I, again, I will stress one thing, because any individual, for example, who historically had actually followed Abraham, upon, if you will, walking out into Sinai with Moses and receiving all these laws, would have had this belief that, well, wait a minute, that's, that's not the religion of my father Abraham. These are different teachings. Any, just like uh, previously said, any individual who was Jewish and encountered Christianity did not seem to, if you will, gel or jive with what they had expected and what they had traditionally known. It's also important to note that not only is the Old Testament, sorry, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, a threaded series of books that have been brought together, it also addresses themes and motifs and religious questions and actual sacred stories from the Near East, much of which we only were able to uncover within the 19th and 20th century. For example, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, you find the story of Utnapishtim, where actually it uncannily is actually the same as the story of Noah. Now, I would argue, and may in the future, that actually when one looks at the story of Utnapishtim and the story of Noah and Noah's Ark, that this is actually addressing this story. It is addressing this theme or motif, just like the concept of the Logos in the New Testament is actually addressing a Greek philosophical notion. And actually pairing it, if you will, 
with a Jewish concept of divine wisdom, which, if anyone's interested, can be found in the Book of Wisdom, in the Apocrypha, or in Chapter 8 of the Book of Proverbs. The question here is, is this once again a syncretism, or is it unifying a series of beliefs, if you will, bringing them back to their original intent and purpose, or using them to communicate a message, and at the same time healing the human consciousness? Or is it merely co-opting and syncretizing? Buddhist syncretism. There is no doubt in anyone's mind who actually reads the original Buddhist writings that Buddhism is taking figures from the Vedic pantheon, pulling them into the sutras of the Buddha, and treating them in a very innovative way. That you find therein Vayu, Agni, Varuna, Indra, the main gods from the Hindu pantheon, but they take on a different facet or a different flavor. You also have the doctrine of samsara pulled directly into Buddhism. In some sense you have, I don't know if this is always obvious to people, but holy Upanishadic thoughts, meaning concepts from Vedantic philosophy based upon the works called the Upanishads. They suddenly appear within Buddhism but they seem to be adjusted. They seem to be, if you will, opened up. At some times they seem to directly contradict the expressions of the Upanishads and the Vedas. Now, is this a syncretism? Is this an individual uh, that we refer to as the Buddha taking his own beliefs, grabbing some issues from the Vedas, uh, from the Brahmanas, from the Upanishads, and just sort of mashing them together in a sort of Frankenstein way. Or once again, is this a diagnosis, a healing, a unifying, and a cleaning? Um, obviously for myself, I believe in each of these cases. It is the divine physician, a term used for the Baha'i manifestation of God, going into a culture, seeing the psychological, spiritual, and cultural challenges that are facing that culture, and using, if you will, the material of that culture to carry them forward and instilling it with a new wine, a new fragrance, a new spirit. If you will, a motif used within the Baha'i writings, taking the trees at the end of a winter and giving them new foliage. Hindu syncretism. Uh, the following are quotes from the Veda itself and from the Bhagavad Gita, and I will read them this time. They call him Indra, Mitra, Varuna, Agni, and he is heavenly, nobly winged Garutman. To what is one, sages give many a title. They call it Agni, Yama, Matarisan. This is a quote that's often used from the Rig Veda to point this out that, in a sense, there are these different names for the Divine One that are attempts to express, if you will, the properties and qualities of the Divine Being itself. This is like, if you will, trying to even describe a car, <laughs> where you're expressing its color, its shape, its form, and you're using all these different adjectives, all these different predicates to describe this one thing. It's not that each and any one of these is the whole thing. The car isn't redness, if you will. The car isn't its motor. The car isn't its drive shaft. But you're trying to describe through all these predicates, all these adjectives, the wholeness of what it is, and these, in a sense, being divine, get personified. Uh, and again, we will look at this in the future, but I would argue, and many already have, that Hinduism is not a polytheistic faith. But here we find another quote, and then the second quote is from the Bhagavad Gita. And again, pardon my pronunciation. <laughs> I am the Self, O Gudakesha, seated in the heart of all creatures. I am the beginning, the middle, and the end of all beings. Of the Adityas, I am Vishnu. Of lights, I am the radiant sun. I am Marichi of the Maruts, and among the stars, I am the moon. Of the Vedas, I am the Samaveda, 
Of the demigods, I am Indra. Of the senses, I am the mind. And in living beings, I am the living force. Of all the Rudras, I am Lord Shiva. Of the Yakshas and the Raksasas, I am the Lord of Wealth. Of the Vasus, I am Fire, Agni. And of the mountains, I am Meru. Of the priests, O Arjuna, know me to be the chief, Biraspati, the Lord of Devotion. Of the generals, I am Skanda, the Lord of War. And of the bodies of water, I am the ocean. Of the great sages, I am Brigu. Of vibrations, I am the transcendental Om. Of sacrifices, I am the chanting of the holy names. And of immovable things, I am the Himalayas. There are several passages like this within the Gita. And this passage is actually quite a bit longer. And this is from chapter 10 of the Gita. Where Krishna, in, in expressing himself to Arjuna, one of the other characters in the Bhagavad Gita, a principal Hindu devotional text, he explains himself to be the height of each of these different classes of being. The one power, divine power, the one beauty, the one love that is actually behind each of these manifestations. And of course, in this case, he even says of the mountains, he is Meru, of the, of the, of the mountain ranges, he is the Himalayas, meaning of all things, he is the apex. Now, when one looks at this, is this actually a brushing aside of the differences? For example, between Shiva and Varuna. Is it trying to, if you will, Frankenstein them together and make them syncretic? Or is it actually coming out and saying, there is a divine spark here. These are the different attributes of my being. This is the different predicates one could actually apply to who I am. This is actually how individuals have attempted to communicate me to mankind at their level through a diagnosis and a remedy. Which one of these is it? Is it actually syncretism or is it unification? Should we, in fact, be anti-syncretic? Is it simply a policy that when we see people taking divergent things and bringing them together, that we should naturally oppose it? Isn't that a truth claim itself? It's interesting, this idea of syncretism, because I think we also find that we can make the claim against atheistic materialism. Is it syncretic? This may come across as a very strange notion, and it is one that we will look at in depth uh, in the future on this site. Can we rationally maintain the ideas, the platonic ideas, of the good, the true, and the beautiful, and at the same time claiming that we are living in a world of pure material matter? Can we say that human life itself has no purpose and no goal, no end to which it is supposed to express itself, and still claim that there are moral properties? That one is responsible, the term I use is beholden, to become an ethical being. But even barring an ethical being, is there a responsibility and a duty for humankind to actually seek knowledge, even to seek truth? To explore it, can the notion of something being true, which sounds like a completely intangible property, actually even be kept within the worldview of atheistic materialism? These are at times complicated questions, and at times I think merely contemplated, or sorry, complicated, because of the sophisticated attempts to answer them. I would ask that we put this on pause, but to consider for yourself, is atheistic materialism itself a syncretism of a metaphysics of materialism, and at the same time, a grabbing of a tradition of humankind of culturation, of cultured minds, of the goals of being a noble being and of actually being a truth-seeking mind, and trying to mash them together. For are there actually moral properties? Or is there in fact not a merely practical benefit to being rational, but is there an innate value hierarchy within these? Because if it is mere pragmatism, what if I don't find it useful to my ends? Again, I only throw this out there for, for your consideration. 
And this will be a topic we're going to go through quite in depth in the future. Empathy with oddity and incredulity. Despite all these sort of syncretistic uh, questions, I, I do empathize. I do truly empathize uh, with the Muslim or with the Jew or with the Christian or the Buddhist or the Hindu when they look at their faith, uh, less so for some, but when they look at their faith and they look at other faiths across the road, if you will, and they see these radical differences, what they perceive to be radical differences, between their faith and another philosophical religious tradition. I have empathy, actually, for someone who is actually studying comparative religion. Why? That's, that's actually where I came from. I myself may have been raised within a Catholic household, may have attended a Catholic church, yet at the same time, when I began to study uh, the world's religions, no doubt there were times where I was like, wow, these things are quite a bit different. At the same time, and we'll go into this more deeply, I thought there might be an underlying unity, which led me first to look deeper, and secondly, to be willing to listen to a Baha'i position. But it's not only myself. I offer to you a quote uh, from the work One Common Faith, which was published by the World Center. The objection most commonly raised against the foregoing conception of religion is the assertion that the differences among the revealed faiths are so fundamental that to present them as stages or aspects of one unified system of truth does violence to the facts. Given the confusion surrounding the nature of religion, the reaction is understandable. Chiefly, however, such an objection offers Baha'is an invitation to set the principles reviewed here more explicitly in the evolutionary context provided in Baha'u'llah's writings. I actually use this quote uh, constantly <laughs> within talks or deepenings that I actually give. Um, the reason why is because, first of all, this passage actually acknowledges one that this is one of the objections most commonly raised. What? The differences are so fundamental that to present them as stages or aspects of one unified system of truth, here, and I want to focus on this quote, does violence to the facts. It seems to go fundamentally against <laughs> the grain of what these different traditions are saying. Why I love it so much is because of the next statement. Given the confusion, the reaction is understandable. So for myself, as a Baha'i, when I encounter someone who, upon hearing the notion of the unity of religion, sees this as bizarre, it's understandable. I, I, I can empathize very much with this, especially, again, because I myself, coming from a background in the study of religion, found it very objectionable. And when would have easily said, well, this appears in many ways to do violence to the facts. That, however, should be seen as what? This work uh, from One Common Faith, which I really seriously <laughs> propose everybody read many times, <laughs> um, it should be seen as an invitation. So think for yourself, if you are a Baha'i watching this, and someone actually comes up to you and you share your idea of the concept of progressive revelation, the unity of religion as expressed by Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha, the Bab, Shoghi Effendi, when this is actually expressed and they say, that's absurd, that is actually a ridiculous notion, this should be understandable. Do your best to empathize with it and then seek if you will, to walk hand in hand with that individual, to explore with them, to accompany them on their investigation of the unity of religion. And if you don't know the answer, or if you don't understand something, seek out someone who might. Even yourself acknowledge that in cases where you, if you don't understand it, say you don't understand, but be willing to look. Your questions are not my questions, and my questions are not your questions. It is absolutely impossible that you would actually in, be in a state where you could answer any possible question of any individual, because some people have questions you've never even thought of. And when it comes to the unity of religion, someone who's actually coming from a Jewish background or from a Hindu background may have questions about the divergence, we say, between Hinduism and Islam, or Christianity and even Judaism, that you've never ever heard of. 
understand it, empathize with it, and seek. The second passage here is from Shoghi Effendi. True, the minds of many are turned away from all that sounds religious. But it is only because they are ill-advised as to the meaning of true religion. And it is just that mission that de devolves upon us to give a new viewpoint, to revive fresh hopes, and to guide by the sacred utterances the thoughts and actions of mankind. This passage from the Guardian is, again, absolutely exquisite. It is not because of some evil, <laughs> some ignorance, in the sense of willful ignorance, that has often generated this, if you will, animosity towards religion. It's, he says that have turned away from all that sounds religious. But why? They're ill-advised as to the meaning. We looked at above that actually, given the actual contention, the animosity that has actually been generated, and often the hatred that actually exists among the various world religions and among the, if you will, the sects and denominations of individual religions, it doesn't seem strange that someone would actually feel hesitant towards these faiths. Equally, we saw above the statement that often what is handed to someone is a superstition, an uninvestigated creed or dogma that is presented as the truth of that religion, and it says, and when they do not bear the analysis of reason, Abdu Baha says, they reject it. And we are to empathize with this too. We're also to empathize, as we just read, with the idea of doing violence to the facts when we present them as one unified whole, or one aspects, or sorry, different aspects of one unified truth. So when it comes to this, when we meet individuals that find religion unpalatable, what are we to do? See it as an invitation. <laughs> Even in here it says, it is just that mission that devolves upon us. To give what? A fresh viewpoint. Revive fresh hopes and guide. So once more, if you're sharing with a friend and they actually see religion as just, forgive me, stupidity and divisive, try for a moment to understand where that's coming from, to empathize with it, and then seek to give a new viewpoint, to offer the truth that you see, and to try to revive fresh hopes for the future of humankind in a cause that will unify them. The next quote is actually a peculiar one in the context. It's actually from Galileo Galilei in the dialogue concerning the two chief world systems. This is actually the work wherein Galileo updates and defends the Copernican vision of what? The sun being in the center of the solar system and the planets orbiting around it, as opposed to the sun being at the center, sorry, the earth being at the center, and the sun, the moon, and all the planets revolving around it. I cannot sufficiently admire the eminence of those men's wits that have received and held it to be true, and with the sprightliness of their judgments offered such violence to their own senses, as that they have been able to prefer that which their reason dictated to them to that which sensible experiments represented most manifestly to the contrary. I cannot find any bounds for my admiration, how that reason was able in Aristarchus and Copernicus to commit such a rape on their senses, as in despite thereof to make herself mistress of their credulity. I actually love this quote uh, by Galileo, because he is praising those wits, <laughs> uh, those minds that received and held to be true, quote, and done such violence to their own senses that they prefer that which is their reason dictated to them to that which sensible experiments represented most manifestly to the contrary. Why is he actually saying this? The reason why, when you look into the history of science, is that when Copernicus and then Galileo were presenting this idea of the sun being at the center and the planets orbiting around it, 
it did violence to the senses. It appeared to do violence to the facts. Why? Because the Earth is spinning at an unimaginable speed, and no one's flying off. Not only is it spinning at an unimaginable speed, and people of that day, it is whirling around the solar system at an unfathomable speed. And yet here we are, resting peacefully upon its surface. This is made all the more, <laughs> if you will, um, visceral, because at the time there wasn't a physics, which we would have to wait for Newton, there was not a physics to explain how this could be possible. They believed in an Aristotelian physics, where things found their natural place and went to the center. That's why rocks fell towards the Earth. That's what kept us on the Earth, because we were closest to the center, on the surface, if you will, of the center. And it's important to note that silence, sorry, silence, science often does seem to do violence to our senses. That was just true does not always actually accord with what the outside forms seem to be telling us, if you will. The example given here is from Galileo, which is the rotating Earth. The fact that it's whipping around the Earth in a massive orbit. But we could add to the emptiness of solid objects that things can have particle and wave-like characteristics. We can, if we look at this, and there are many examples within the sciences, that there is some, as we will see, common unity to something like helium and gold. The question isn't if it does violence to our senses, if it does violence to our facts. Many truths do. The question is, do we stop there? Do we investigate? To see if, in spite of something doing, seeming to do violence to the facts, or doing violence to our senses, is it true? And if it is a truth claim, and it is important, which religion is, if it is possible they are unified, are we willing to put in the time to explore that idea? I think this is important too because, of course, as we saw above, individuals can, being raised within a Jewish household, if you will, simply fall into being Jewish. Someone being a Christian is just either merely culturally a Christian, because it's connected to their heritage, but at the same time it may actually be that it's not merely that it's their heritage, but they don't question it. I would offer it once again that this is the same thing with secularism, atheism, or agnosticism, or existentialism. Um, I remember, I think it's a quote from Richard Lewontin, if I'm not uh, in error. Doesn't matter. <laughs> the point was is that, uh, you know, a famous biologist, and he actually said that, um, I must be honest, I ingested my atheistic materialism with my broccoli at the dinner table. It is really important to acknowledge that wherever you are actually raised influences your belief systems. If you've been raised, for example, with an atheistic household, and actually religion itself has been disparaged in front of you since you were a little boy, or some other religion because you are religious, in each case this is going to, if you will, twist and warp how you will see that subject, whether or not you even believe that it is worthy of an investigation. As Abdu'l-Bahá said above, that the opinion of many cultured men is that religion needs no powers of reflection. Has this happened to many individuals? Yes, these are the quotes we've actually been looking at. It actually has. Many people really don't like the smell of anything religious. But often what I find is that's not because of actually a genuine and often deep knowledge of what those traditions say. It is simply a cultural milieu, a cultural momentum that is carrying us away from something that may be pristinely beautiful. What in the end are some of these examples that we're actually talking about? In the case of the religious world, that seem to do violence to the facts. There are many of them, actually. When we look at the different world religions, 
We seem that apparently there is no God in Buddhism. Buddhism is often portrayed as a purely agnostic, even just purely philosophical way of life. And many things within Buddhism are actually often completely extracted. You'll hear people say there are no hells in Buddhism. You'll actually hear people share the doctrine of anatman, no soul, as something which it doesn't seem to be within the scriptures. Yet on the surface, we seem to see no God. Um, yet when we move to, for example, Christianity, Christianity is often portrayed as a religion wherein there is a triune being, the doctrine known as the Trinity. Yet strangely, that is not a doctrine remotely accepted by either Jews or Muslims. The concept of in Hinduism of Brahman does not seem to actually gel or jive <laughs> um, with the idea of God in the Quran. On the surface, these seem rather different. Even the example, which many do not know of, and there's understandable reasons why, uh, with Zoroastrianism, people have portrayed Zoroastrianism as almost a system of dualism. Two supreme beings, at times presented as equal, one evil, one good, at war. How can these possibly be the same underlying truth? But it goes beyond this because it seems that the doctrines of salvation that are expressed, for example, in Christianity, where one must be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ in his sacrifice upon the cross, seems in some sense different and quite different from actually a notion of Jewish sacrifice even, something that is often portrayed as if it's very close. But here in Jewish sacrifice, it is actually an abomination to even consider the sacrifice of a human. And secondly, the sacrificial system itself appears within the Old Testament to be something that goes on eternally, an everlasting covenant between God and the people of Israel. But what does this have to do, for example, with the notion of nirvana that we find within the Buddhist scriptures? Or even in a sense of moksha, the goal of a religious, devout practice. And isn't even the concept of moksha, as it's represented, for example, in the Upanishads, seem to be quite different than, if you will, the bhakti yoga, the devotional love of Krishna that we find within the Bhagavad Gita. How can these be brought together and seen as a unified whole? It often seems difficult. We seem to find a soul in Christianity. But that notion doesn't seem, at least on the surface, to be the same as the concepts we find within the Old Testament. Can we really see the doctrine of a soul that is represented in the New Testament and the doctrine of an Atman represented in Buddhist writings? Is it not the direct negation of that idea? And those are the questions. Is not in Buddhism itself grabbing onto a whole bunch of Vedic and Upanishadic notions and bringing in Vedic beings, Vedic, sorry, Hindu, ancient Hindu beings and ancient Hindu doctrines and ideas, and then actually injecting into it, if you will, things that have no place there and seem to do, if you will, violence to the facts of the Vedas and the Upanishads. These are the questions one has to look at. Um, can we not see, for example, that in Christianity, there was the crucifixion, a central motif of the New Testament. And yet, as many Christians believe, and some Muslims do as well, does not the Quran seem to say that Jesus Christ was never crucified, or that it was a mere semblance? Does not the Quran itself say that Jesus, sorry, that the Prophet Muhammad was the seal of the prophets, and that no prophets can come after him? If so, what of the Baha'i faith? There are many of these, and they're actually, you know, it may seem strange to many, solvable. <laughs> but they are solvable through an honest exploration of these traditions. And this is what we're trying to look at here on this channel, but also in this presentation, ways that we can begin to actually explore these things. 
and for ourselves to answer our own questions. For as we know, independent investigation of truth is the fundamental principle of the Baha'i faith. Now, as strange as many of these unities might seem, there are a lot of unifications within the intellectual world that we often hear and grow up with that themselves only seem normal and commonplace, I believe, well, because we've grown up with them, because we actually have simply been around them. And what are some of these? Um, one of the first ones that often comes to mind, it's a very simple one. Um, it seems strange, and it would have seemed strange to many, that something like yellow is red, or purple, or blue. That in some sense, when you're seeing the very colors of the rainbow, and many more, that you're actually looking at the expressions and manifestations of one underlying reality. There's an intuitive unity to it, of course, because one might say, well, they're all colors. They, if you will, seem to actually be of a type. They are examples of a certain type of phenomenon. But it's not manifestly obvious at the outset that these could or would be manifestations of one underlying reality. But I think that actually one is quite simple. I, as an individual, when I take myself out of the historical context that I live in, when I think something like um, the stone in my backyard, the living flesh in my hand, the gas in a helium balloon, something that I can breathe and make my voice squeaky, <laughs> that these could actually be manifestations of one fundamental underlying physical constituent. Then in some sense, everything around you is made up of electrons, protons, and neutrons. I know we grow up with this, but it actually seems rather bizarre when you begin to think of it. When you look, for example, at water, at air, and at lead, is there an immediate understanding that, oh, of course, these are the external, if you will, the external properties of the arrangement and structure of some underlying unified reality? I honestly would suggest that to say that this is obvious to you is actually absurd. It is something that we have only in very recent history, come to really understand. Yes, again, might there be some intuitive truth to this? Might there be something that seems to make this true? Yes, I believe there is. In this section, in essence, when we look at the various elements of our world, the constituents that make up all created things, is it really immediately intuitive that all of them are actually manifestations of some underlying phenomenon? No, I don't think it is. And yet we believe it to be true. And how did we come about discovering this underlying fundamental unity? We did so through investigation, through the application of rational scientific thought, by using philosophical devices, as well as physical devices, to explore them. I think that it's important to actually notice this. I think that even when we look at many of the things, can space and time, as it's proposed in Einsteinian theory, really be two manifestations of one underlying, if you will, fabric? Is that intuitive? And if not intuitive, is it still true? The question of whether or not religion is itself a unified phenomenon, if there is some underlying unity may actually be false, but that cannot be ascertained unless and until we truly do an investigation. Oftentimes when we look at the biological world, to think that certain biological entities have a common ancestor in the primordial mists of time, for many people seems an obvious fact. But if an obvious fact, then we would deny the brilliance of a Charles Darwin just like when it comes to the fundamental unity of the composite matter around us, we'd be, we would be denying the brilliance of modern-day physics. 
there are different facets of unities that seem to actually be peculiar. For example, when we look at something like computation. How, what is computation? What is even something as simple as addition and subtraction? It can actually be embodied in various underlying physical phenomena. Something that is computing is whatever is computing, whether it be made out of binary code, whether we be doing it on a steam-powered, if you will, analytic engine or difference engine. Please look it up. <laughs> um, how it's actually embodied is not the question. It is itself what is the underlying, if you will, abstract concept that isn't being embodied. Even something as simple as money. When we look at money, and ask what is it, if we begin to study the physical coins themselves, so the physical paper, we'll end up in different domains. Yet it is this abstract concept that unifies the variety of phenomenon we refer to as money. What about a theory? What about an idea? Can we actually embody, for example, the proposition that there is a common biological origin for all the great apes, an aspect of Darwinian theory, and can we actually embody that in ways that on the surface seem radically different? Yes, it's called Mandarin, English, Spanish, and Arabic. We can actually have an underlying propositional unity, a truth functional unity that undergirds the reality that it gets manifested within different linguistic expressions, even so far as to be mere ink upon a page or binary code in a computer. We could carve out the origin of the species, if you will, in you know Sumerian cuneiform wedge writing on clay tablets, and if a true translation would still be that same theory. Can this be seen that the propositions underlying the very languages, the various scripts, are fundamentally the same thing? Yes, we do this all the time in translations. What is the unity that makes up, for example, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony? When I play it, for example, on my guitar, is that the same symphony as that which is actually played, that same song, that which is played for by an entire symphony? I would suggest in some sense yes, in some sense no, but it's definitely not my composition. <laughs> um, this is, there is a whole host of things within the reality of our world that when we look at what they are, on their surface, they appear very different. The same goes for moral properties, in fact. What is generosity? Is it the giving of money? Is it the giving of time? Is it the giving of food? What is it unites each of these disparate expressions that we bring under the rubric or the term of generosity? What of humility? Can we be humble in many different ways? Can we be honest in many different ways? These are questions, again, that we will investigate in the future on this site. I think in the end, and we have to, and if I'm being honest, there are many cases in which, yes, as I've said, there is an intuitive unity to these things. Then in some sense, we understand that honesty can be expressed in so many different ways, even honesty to ourselves. But that there's some fundamental underlying abstract concept that is being embodied in each of them. When we look at the many things of our physical world, Yes, helium seems very different than gold or lead. Something like mercury doesn't seem to be oxygen. Yet, in some way, they are the same stuff. There seems to be something that unites them. Why else would the pre-Socratic philosophers be proposing things like everything is water, in the case of Thales of Miletus? Why would people be proposing that there is some underlying unity if there wasn't some, if you will, like a gist or, an, or, or a type or an essence that was undergirding all of them. For myself, when I began studying the various world religions, there was a similar sentiment. What if? There was a question. What if? What if I'm actually looking at things that actually have been expressed at different times and places just like the elements of our world, just like the different colors. But in some sense, there is an underlying reality which unites the spiritual narrative of humankind. That was my question. And then I met some Baha'is. An illusion is often made 
in discussing, for example, within uh, the atheistic world, individuals such as Richard Dawkins. When speaking not in religion, but in the case actually of the biological unity and of common descent. How the processes of evolution could have generated all these various, if you will, biological entities, all these different phenotypes. And people will say, well, just I just can't believe it. And he will say, and I think rightfully I mean, in many cases, uh, that's the argument from personal incredulity. What you're saying is, I just can't believe that. And we have to recognize that this is not an argument. <laughs> this is not a point even being make and made outside of, I just don't think that's true. Or I can't see how that's true at this point in my life. Or at my level of understanding or my level of knowledge, it doesn't seem to gel with what I believe is true. That is what we're supposed to, as Baha'is, as we've read previously, find understandable, what we're supposed to empathize with, and realize that the responsibility devolves upon us to do our best to communicate how we can see this as being fundamentally unified. The argument from personal incredulity is not an argument. It is a mere brush off, but still we can empathize and offer. The fundamental principles of the prophets are correct and true. The imitations and superstitions which have crept in are at wide variance with the original precepts and commands. Simply put, that many imitations and superstitions have actually crept in, and if, if you will, morph these original precepts. Now this is a claim that we would have to investigate. Again, the following from Abdu Baha in Paris Talks. All these divisions we see on all sides, all these disputes and opposition, are caused because men cling to ritual and outward observances, and forget the simple underlying truths. It is the outward practices of religion that are so different, and it is they that cause disputes and enmity, while the reality is always the same and one. The reality is the truth, and truth has no division. Truth is God's guidance. It is the light of the world. It is love. It is mercy. These attributes of truth are also human virtues inspired by the Holy Spirit. So let us one and all hold fast to truth, and we shall be free indeed. The day is coming when all the religions of the world will unite. For in principle they are one already. There is no need for division, seeing that it is only the outward forms that separate them. So we find variation, first of all, obviously within the outer practices of religion. There's no doubt that for a Christian, when you look at the expression of the Jewish law, you do not see what you do now. Then when a Muslim actually looks at the structure and systems of Christianity or Judaism, cannot possibly see that what their Quran tells them, how to order society and how to express the divine will, is identical to that which is within the New Testament and the Hebrew Scriptures. Even a Jewish individual cannot remotely claim that what Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the patriarchs of Judaism were doing is actually what they themselves are performing under the guidance of Moses. Now this isn't to brush, a law, uh, brush off theological or doctrines of salvation, these differences, as we've addressed above, but it's important that these cannot possibly be a rejection of the unity of religion. For were a Christian to object that, say, the Baha'i faith does not have in it the institutions and social structures that he sees within his own faith, he wouldn't stay a Christian, he would have to become a Jew. But then becoming a Jewish individual, if that was a true objection, would have to realize, well, wait a minute, Moses gave us ordinances and commandments that he himself does not acknowledge within the lives of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <laughs> And then within themselves have to fall back to something that is only recorded, really, within the books of Moses himself. So there, there appears to be, in some sense, a functional definition 
or a propositional definition in the examples I've just given. That something is a computer as long as it computes. Something is money as long as it actually recognizes instances of transaction and tracks some agreed upon value in the world. Something is the true proposition, the example I gave is, it is the origin of the species and is Darwin's work, even if it's written in Cantonese. Why? Because the underlying propositional truth content of it is actually birthed from Charles Darwin. And I think there is great benefit to actually considering such things and looking at how, really how is it for a Christian that that which is actually encoded in the Torah is actually in, in essence being expressed within Christianity. How is it even more so how concepts of the divine, when we get to the more the theological or the soteriological, the study of salvation, how maybe, let's just say maybe, we are actually looking at Cantonese and English, but in actual fact, the original doctrine and precept underneath it is itself being manifested in these two language communities, in these two symbolic representations, but the underlying truth is still the same. Therefore, the foundations of the religious systems are one, because all proceed from the indivisible reality. But the followers of these systems have disagreed. Discord, strife, and warfare have arisen among them. For they have forsaken the foundation, and held to that which is but imitation and semblance. Inasmuch as imitations differ, enmity and dissension have resulted. If Christians of all denominations and divisions should investigate reality, the foundations of Christ will unite them. No enmity or hatred will remain, for they will all be under the one guidance of reality itself. Likewise, in the wider field, if all the existing religious systems will turn away from ancestral imitations and investigate reality, seeking the real meaning of the holy books, they will unite and agree upon the same foundation, reality itself. As long as they follow counterfeit doctrines or imitations instead of reality, animosity and discord will exist and increase. In this quote, Abdu'l-Bahá talks about how if Christians of all denominations actually come together and put aside their own traditions and creeds and dogmas, they can actually unite in principle. And in the wider field of existing religions, if people would say, you know, we actually have our interpretation of this holy book. This is our understanding of what it is. What if, in fact, this isn't the only interpretation, this isn't the only understanding of this religious text? How can we see how maybe, from a Buddhist perspective, a Buddha appeared in the West? Potentially, in the physical temple, right? Not of Siddhartha Gautama, but actually in the person of Jesus Christ. Is it possible? And is it potentially the way we have interpreted this that is actually making it impossible for us to actually see a divine light, see the same light in a different lamp there on the other side of the world. So we have these, these semblances and imitations, we have these cultural expressions, if you will, the law of Moses or the sacramental system of Christianity, but we also have this issue of the underlying propositional content, what if they are being communicated in different symbols, what if our interpretation of these symbols and while this seems unlikely <laughs> to many people, that we would somehow be able to unify the different world religions under one recognition of a common source of the spiritual history of humankind, and many people have shared this with me, how equally unlikely that each of these communities will completely drop what they believe and, for example, become atheist or become secular or New Age. How the Baha'is see this is not simply that there is an intellectual process going on where many people sit down, and of course it, it refers to actually seeking the meanings of the holy books in this quote, but it's not merely that. It is actually that this is the will of God for humankind in this day. 
and that there are processes at work within society that are forcing us to actually address these issues, to come together and to investigate. Buddha also established a new religion, and Confucius renewed the ancient conduct and morals. But the original precepts have been entirely changed, and their followers no longer adhere to the original pattern of belief and worship. The founder of Buddhism was a precious being who established the oneness of God. But later his original precepts were gradually forgotten and displaced by primitive customs and rituals until in the end it led to the worship of statues and images. It's important to note here in this quote that Abdu'l-Baha is stating that Confucius was a renewer of what? Ancient conduct and morals. Not that he was a manifestation of God, but it's using this very large social movement, this very large social and moral philosophy, and saying that its precepts have been entirely changed in the face of the process of history. It is parallel with what happened to Buddhism. That the original precepts are gradually forgotten and displaced. We move on. Consider, for example, that Christ admonished the people time and again to heed the Ten Commandments of the Torah and insisted upon their strict observance. Now, one of the Ten Commandments forbids the worship of images and statues. Yet today there are myriad images and statues in the churches of certain Christian denominations. It is clear and evident, then, that the religion of God does not preserve its original precepts among the people but that it is gradually changed and altered to the point of being entirely effaced, and thus a new manifestation appears and a new religion is established. For if the former religion had not been changed and altered, there would be no need for renewal. In this quote, in the second part of this quote, Abdu'l-Baha then compares the current standing of Christianity with what had happened to Buddhism, and another example, Confucianism. And it's saying that it does not preserve its original precepts among the people. Now we know, given the Baha'i writings, on the status of the New Testament, the holiness of this text, that it is not stating that we lost the New Testament. Even the Quran openly states that the book is in the hands of the people, as you can see in another one of our videos. But here, it's saying it's gradually being changed and altered, and things are being displaced, and that suddenly innovations, beliefs, and practices came into the tradition that were not its original intent, that begin to actually shift it to a point where the original intent was being lost. Abdu'l-Baha also states that the remedy here, as it might have seemed so far as simply to work back within these traditions to the original precepts, what does he actually state is the remedy itself? The remedy itself, as he is stating it, is what? And thus a new manifestation appears and a new religion is established. That there comes to be sort of an effacing or disruption of the original intent, and it becomes very, very difficult, near not well nigh impossible, to truly actually simply through human innovation and human effort to actually bring people back to its original teaching. But rather, a new theory is brought forward. A new perspective that actually cuts through much of the, if you will, underbrush that is blocking our vision so that we can come back to its original intent. In the beginning, this tree was full of vitality and laden with blossoms and fruit. But gradually it grew old, spent and barren, until it entirely withered and decayed. That is why the true gardener will again plant a tender sapling of the same stock, that it may grow and develop day by day, extend its sheltering shade in this heavenly garden, and yield its prized fruit. So it is with the divine religions. With the passage of time, their original precepts are altered. Their underlying truth entirely vanishes. Their spirit departs. Doctrinal innovations spring up, and they become a body without a soul. That is why they are renewed. So the original precepts are altered. 
the truths themselves get covered over. And it's interesting here, it says, the spirit departs, doctrinal innovations spring up, and they become a body without a soul. That is why they are renewed. That there's a different, there's different aspects of the Baha'i teachings. One is this of progressive revelation, of the divine physician actually bringing a teaching to humankind that is actually tailored for their age. But it's also that many of the doctrinal innovations and the traditions and superstitions that, if you will, have crept into the foundation of actually these religions necessitate that a new sapling of the same stock be placed. And that that former teachings, the former community, in a sense, be actually brought under the sway of this new sapling as it grows up with the DNA of the original stock. So they are, in a sense, renewed, born again. Our meaning is that the followers of Buddha and Confucius now worship images and statues and have become entirely unaware of the oneness of God, believing instead in imaginary gods, as did the ancient Greeks. But such were not their original precepts. Indeed, their original precepts and conduct were entirely different. So, it's interesting here that even in the case of the Greeks, that actually Abdu'l-Baha is stating that they come to actually worship these imaginary gods. We actually find this actually in the New Testament, that they turned from the unknowable God and began to worship the image of men and of creeping things and of beasts. That really the customs and traditions and creeds and dogmas and innovations once again slowly creep in and hide the original tent of the revelation. Again, consider to what an extent the original precepts of the Christian religion have been forgotten, and how many doctrinal innovations have sprung up. For example, Christ forbade violence and revenge, and enjoined instead that evil and injury be met with benevolence and loving kindness. But observe how many bloody wars have taken place among the Christian nations themselves, and how much oppression, cruelty, rapacity, and bloodthirstiness have resulted therefrom. Indeed, many of these wars were carried out at the behest of the popes. It is therefore abundantly clear that, with the passage of time, religions are entirely changed and altered, and hence they are renewed. Much of this idea of the innovations and dogmas and creeds is very difficult to deny when one actually looks at the history of these traditions. There are numerous denominations. Numerous schisms that have happened, and separations, and divisions that have occurred within the world religions. Very often to the point where, depressingly, you will actually have a Christian from one denomination, not willing to speak or associate, with actually another denomination, where they are so at odds. And you don't only happen this, have this in Christianity. This happens in Buddhism, in Hinduism even. And... It's important to know that these are not monolithic communities. They're often misrepresented as such. People will say things like, Christians believe, or Buddhists believe. Or in actual fact, it should be, well, some Buddhists believe this, or some Christians believe that. Some Muslims have this view, right? Some Hindus have this interpretation. These are not monolithic communities, which is an evidence of this in innovation and this interpolation, these coming in of actual traditions. This is why Abdu'l-Baha speaks so much of mere imitation as opposed to investigating the underlying reality. And yes, you have this aspect where the Muslim looks at Christianity through the lens of Islam. The Christian looks at Judaism through the lens of the New Testament. And again, even a Jewish individual who follows the law of Moses sees the lives of the patriarch, the stories of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, those early heritage of the Jewish faith through the eyes of Moses. A Buddhist looks at Hinduism through the perspective of the sutras of the Buddha. Likewise, a Baha'i 
tries to understand these prior revelations, which have undeniably been encrusted and separated, through the vision of Baha'u'llah. And it is not necessary, it is not in this sense saying, and we will look at this again, that actually we have a, are looking at the real scripture. Rather, we are offering an interpretation, and that interpretation and understanding of those scriptures has to be weighed in the balances of rationality, of its fruitfulness for humankind, of its ability to unify different phenomena and different teachings, of its ability to solve problems, like any rational scientific theory when it is offered to humankind. Does it deal with the, the evidence? Does it actually unify our understanding? Does it simplify our conception, in this case, of the divine? In the next video, we're going to be looking at some of these avenues of approach. Ways that we can begin to explore these religions and to ex explore, in a sense, the divergencies that we seem to see. What are the tools that we can begin to use to look at religion as the varied expressions of one underlying reality, the many different colors, if you will, of one fundamental source. How can we begin to explore this and see the human religious history as the many chapters of one book, the many love letters written by the Divine Friend to humankind? Now, today we're going to be looking at what I call avenues of approach, meaning if we are going to actually look at these revelations and try to see how they might have one underlying reality, like the various colors of the spectrum, or for example, the manifold ways that electrons, protons, and neutrons manifest themselves within the physical world. Um, what are these avenues of approach that we can take? The first I often call textual empiricism, uh, with there are several sub-principles in it, and it is this. We have these scriptures. Um, we are not bound by the historical interpretive process that has been put, put forward by these traditions. And this is often uh, jarring to individuals who actually come from other traditions, say from Buddhism or Christianity, because the response will really be, but that, that, that's not Christianity. Um, yet, this quote from Abdu'l-Bahá uh, might shed some light on it. But when we speak of religion, we mean the essential foundation or reality of religion, not the dogmas and blind imitations which have gradually encrusted it, and which are the cause of the decline and effacement of a nation. These are inevitably destructive and a menace and hindrance to a nation's life. So in this quote, uh, Abdu'l-Bahá is saying that these divine religions, which were revealed from God to humankind, have become gradually encrusted. If you will, it's as if we pulled something out of the earth in an archaeological dig and we're looking at it. We understand this is a man-made artifact, or for example, a dinosaur bone. But we actually have to scrape it and dust it off in an attempt to understand what it actually means. There is another aspect of this, which is that I am, well, me and not you, and I have to go through the process of independent investigation and be honest about what I'm doing and do the best I can to understand this revelation on its own terms. How that's often seen say, for example, a Buddhist, is that, well, the understanding of that interpretation, of that scripture, sorry, on its own terms, means understanding it as Buddhists from my denomination understand it. Forgetting for the fact that there are various, various different denominations of Buddhism. Same with Christianity or Islam. It's really this principle of free interpretation, which is under, if you will, the principle of textual empiricism. Um, I am supposed to be doing my best to understand what is biblical, if I'm studying the Bible, what is Quranic, if I'm attempting to understand the Quran, trying to understand what, for example, the Mahayana or Theravadan scriptures are saying, but making sure 
that I'm not necessarily simply taking the interpretations that have come to me through this denomination or sect. Um, so we have to separate, if you will, the text and the interpretation. And it's quite jarring often, and I think most of us who have actually, if you will, worked within trying to understand even our own scripture, um, or scriptures of other faiths, is that people often have a very difficult time separating their understanding of what a text says and the text itself. I've very often been sitting with someone, they're like, but it just says X. And I would say, well, I understand that that's how you understand that text, <laughs> that this is actually, for example, how your tradition or your communion, your group understand that text, but it isn't necessarily what the text says. Uh, th that's actually an interpretation of it. And I don't read it that way. Uh, in the future, we'll go into more and more examples of this. But for now, it's really um, to say that, well, the Bible teaches. Well, there's, a very, there's varied understandings, manifold understandings and interpretations of these texts. Now, this principle of free interpretation and textual empiricism may sound like we're just trying to get you know, out of a, <laughs> a difficult problem. But this is something that almost every individual of these traditions will understand. If I myself am raised within a Catholic society, and some societies are and have been extremely Catholic, what is my Protestant friend going to be asking me to do? They're going to ask me to do an independent investigation of the New Testament free from the historical momentum of interpretation and dogma that is actually enshrined within Catholic doctrine and try to see this revelation in the empirical form of its actual text with fresh eyes. Uh, this would be the same with two individuals who have very, very different perspectives, for example, on Vedantic Hinduism. They're going to be doing what? Asking each other to actually go back and actually investigate, say, the Upanishads, to try and understand anew what this is actually saying. And there are principles that if you will also connect to this, which is that um, many of these works use the same themes, the same motifs, the same words and concepts over and over and over again. This would be the principle of internal definition. If I wish to understand, for example, what the New Testament means by fruit, Jesus Christ says that there are good trees and bad trees, good, which have good fruit and bad fruit, and um, he uses this as an analogy for true and false prophets, and you're supposed to test them. If I want to understand what fruit means, while I have a free interpretation, there is the textual empiricism. I can actually go to the scripture itself to understand how that term is used. And this is not in any way remotely solely connected to religious texts. I can actually go into the works of Karl Marx, one of the originators of communism, and he uses as a phrase, false consciousness. And I can actually look into his works in all the places that he uses that term to have a better understanding of what Karl Marx means by false consciousness. This is actually what it would be mean to be textually empirical related to the writings of Karl Marx. So if I want to understand what for example, the word news in the Quran means, uh, I can look up all the places that that is actually used. If I want to understand what, for example, Richard Dawkins means by selfish uh, in the selfish gene, given that genes can't have motivations, I would do what? I would go through all the works of Richard Dawkins to try to understand what he means by that term or by that symbol, or by that motif. And this goes for anything. If you want to understand what wine means in the writings of Rumi, you can actually do an investigation of that, an independent investigation. And this isn't actually limited to English translations. Um, we have a principle of original languages. If I want to understand what fruit means within the New Testament, there are tons of websites and search engines and Greek concordances and Arabic concordances for the Quran where I can actually look into them to try to understand, well, how many times is this Greek root used? How many different permutations of that root? Now, are they all 
if you will, truly, truly related to each other, and then investigate what it means. Now, we will see in a future video that when we actually look at, a, say, a passage in the Quran that says, uh, if a wicked man comes to you with news, look into it carefully, lest you harm a people in ignorance and later have to repent. Well, I can take almost every single word within that phrase if I want to understand what that ayat or that verse of the Quran means, and I can actually look at, well, when he says, if a wicked man comes to you with news, what is that word news? What does it mean? I can even look at the Arabic root and see how many different forms of it are used in the Quran, and allow, like the writings of Karl Marx with false consciousness, allow the Quran to self-define. Of course, then, I can always actually look at the great minds of Islam. I can actually investigate what people have said. I can try to understand what is Shia thinks that means, or what a Sunni thinks that means. I can do this with the Catholic, the Protestant, the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox. I can really delve in if I wish to truly understand this, and there are a great many resources and avenues of approach that I have before me. The second principle, or great principle, meta-principle, is progressive revelation. This is a fundamental tenet of the Baha'i Faith, that we, when we're looking at the different religions of God, are looking at a universal religious belief that is, if you will, many fountains fed from one source. But the progressive aspect is, is that there is an evolutionary context. The most commonly actually addressed is the evolutionary context of the different social teachings that we find within each revelation. We're going to add a principle to that that I will suggest, but for now, let's look at some of the writings of the central figures. That the diverse communions of the earth and the manifold systems of religious belief should never be allowed to foster the feelings of animosity amongst men is in this day of the essence of the faith of God and his religion. These principles and laws, these firmly established and mighty systems, have proceeded from one source and are the rays of one light. That they differ one from another is to be attributed to the varying requirements of the ages in which they were promulgated. Gird up the loins of your endeavor, O people of Baha, that haply the tumult of religious dissension and strife that agitateth the peoples of the earth may be stilled, that every trace of it may be completely obli obliterated, for the love of God and them that serve him, arise to aid this most sublime and momentous revelation. Religious fanaticism and hatred are a world-devouring fire, whose violence none can quench. The hand of divine power can alone deliver mankind from this desolating affliction. So in this quote from the Greening, Gleanings of the Writings of Baha'u'llah, it brings out a really heartfelt principle, really, I think, from almost all humankind. We may at times try to avert our gaze from it if we come from any religious dispensation, or even of a non-religious dispensation, because of the horrible things that have been perpetrated within the names of various belief systems. That, there, that religious fanaticism and hatred are a world-devouring fire. They have torn apart the body politic. And I say that this isn't solely uh, within the religious domain, because when we look at actually, uh, if you sorry to put it, but the body count of actual communistic and atheistic ideologies, it, it is atrocious. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that that is a false belief, like any other belief system. The issue here is, is that the essence of the faith of God, according to this quote of Baha'u'llah, is that these are rays of one light, and that religious differences, no matter if someone agrees or disagrees, should never be allowed to foster dissension. Uh, we will look at this in the future, in the principle of the unity of religion, that actually the Baha'i writings actually state that it would be better if you were not religious, if that religious devotion is going to bring up within you a desire to harm another person, or hate another individual. Um, the principle at the very end of this quote uh, is something we should really take stock of as Baha'is, and as non-Baha'is who might be uh, watching this, why, why Baha'is are so, uh, if you will, 
<laughs> intense regarding this issue of religious unity from a Baha'i perspective. It is that religious fanaticism uh, cannot be quenched just by political agreements, merely by socially getting together. That this is a fire that can only be quenched by the hand of divine power, through the healing remedy of the social and spiritual teachings of the Baha'i Faith in this day. This next quote is from Abdu'l Baha. The world of humanity may be likened to the individual man himself. It has its illness and ailments. A patient must be diagnosed by a skillful physician. The prophets of God are the real physicians. In whatever age or time they appear, they prescribe for human conditions. They know the sicknesses. They discover the hidden sources of disease and indicate the necessary remedy. Whosoever is healed by that remedy finds eternal health. For instance, in the day of Jesus Christ, the world of humanity was afflicted with various ailments. Jesus Christ was the real physician. He appeared, recognized the symptoms, and prescribed the real remedy. What was that remedy? It was his revealed teaching, especially applicable to that age. Later on, many new ailments and disorders appeared in the body politic. The world became sick. Other severe mal maladies appeared, especially in the peninsula of Arabia. God manifested Muhammad there. He came and prescribed for the conditions so that the Arabs became healthy, strong, and viral in that time. So here, Abdu Baha uses uh, explicitly the analogy of the manifestations of God as physicians, divine physicians, who come into this world with a mission and a charge from God to actually diagnose the problems and prescribe the remedy. That the revelation from God unto mankind that appeared in the time of Jesus Christ through that holy temple of the prophet of Galilee uh, was meant for that age and were especially applicable to that age and that this is the same with each of the manifestations of God. That the varying conditions that you see within the revelations of, say, Islam or Buddhism have some relationship to the evolutionary context and what mankind had to hear and the medicine that they needed to take in that era. I would add that, and this is something we're going to look at more and more as time goes on, that this isn't solely the social teachings of that revelation unto humankind. Uh, an analogy I often use is um, most people know the idea, for example, of a dead metaphor. Uh, in fact, dead metaphor, <laughs> the phrase, is itself a dead metaphor. It is that oftentimes <laughs> symbolic communication con used to convey an idea loses its symbolic nature. Um, when I say dead metaphor, you don't think immediately of something having died. Just like when I say if you understand, you don't see it as, as standing under something. That the, the, the expressions of the divine physicians, when they attempt to actually convey a principle of the divine world unto humankind, are forced really to actually communicate this within physical language, within what Abdu'l-Bah calls sensible language. That at times, these teachings, our ears become deaf to them. <laughs> metaphorically speaking, we become deaf and blind to the actual light, the, the ideas and concepts that are behind those images, so that they need to be renewed in a new receptacle, so that humankind can actually once again drink of those teachings. Um, this is the concept where in the New Testament it says, you do not pour new wine into old wineskins, or thereby you ruin both. Problems arise where followers of one of the world's faiths prove unable to distinguish between its eternal and transitory features. 
an attempt to impose on society rules of behavior that have long since accomplished their purpose. The principle is fundamental to an understanding of religion's social role. The remedy the world needeth in its present-day afflictions can never be the same as that which a subsequent age may require, Baha'u'llah points out. Be anxiously concerned with the needs of the age ye live in, and center your deliberations on its exigencies and requirements. In this quote from the World Center, from the work One Common Faith, uh, we find a principle that I think is not discussed enough within the Baha'i communities and shared with non-Baha'is alike. And it is the source often of a confusion that I find um, that arises between myself and, and friends of the faith and friends, of, friends and family alike. It is that when I understand the unity of religion, and I believe that, for example, Christianity was a divinely revealed religion, as was Islam or Buddhism or Zoroastrianism, this in no way means that I believe that that revelation is applicable to today. That I am anxiously concerned with the age, the needs of the age in which I live, and I recognize, for example, that the imposition of social rules and behaviors deriving from the Quran actually will cause problems to arise. <laughs> and have caused problems to arise. That I do not believe by any means, for example, that the social injunctions and teachings within the Torah, the core of the Jewish scriptures, are actually supposed to be used today. No, they were actually revealed in the age in which they were revealed, and were meant to guide humankind for a time. And that if we are unable to acknowledge this difference between the eternal and transitory features of any revelation, that problems are going to arise because we're going to attempt to uh, impose on society rules that have long since accomplished their purpose. And you think of this, if I myself am, say, an Orthodox Jew, and I believe that you know the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures themselves, have been revealed by God to humankind to guide them, a real intense cognitive dissonance begins to arise. Because how can I then go back and begin to edit them? If I really believe they're divine, and this is something that uh, atheists and secularists have brought up for a long time, like, you're, you're saying this is divine, and now you want to, yeah, but you know, this doesn't fit, and this is like, like there's no way we should do that. Um, there's a cognitive dissonance that arises here because, you know, you believe this is divine. So, of course, you're going to want to have it as the guiding principle of your nation and potentially nations. Um, same thing with a Muslim or a Zoroastrian or a Buddhist or a Hindu. When you're looking at it, you believe this to be divine revelation, and at the same time, you, you, you can't then state, well, then I shouldn't impose these rules on society. No, you actually believe those are the, the rules that God revealed for the imposition to be imposed on society. This is the, the challenge that we're actually facing as a globe. We have to be able to discern between that which was revealed by the divine physician for the ailments of society and then the age in which that manifestation of God came and differentiate between its eternal and transitory features, and obviously the challenge is psychologically that once this occurs, then you think, well, how can it possibly be that things have changed so much that they're actually need, that these principles revealed by the divine world no longer apply, then what do apply? Well, what happens is, is you actually begin to look around and see if something else has been revealed. This is, if you will, the pressure cooker of investigation that actually causes the, the heart and soul to begin to long for a new divine message. This is the principle of the evolutionary teachings enshrined within every revelation. There is one uh, other quick aspect of this I have to address. Um, when I claim to believe in the divine origins of Christianity, one of the greatest difficulties I have in communicating how I see the world to uh, friends and family is that it means to them that I, they hear, if you will, that I believe what Christians believe. 
at the same time that usually is actually pared down from Christians. And when they say Christians, they mean Catholics. But even when it's Catholics, it might not be real academic and intelligent Catholicism, which exists and is beautiful. It's what my friend actually believes who happens to be Catholic. It's like when someone asks me as a Baha'i, and I've had this happen, they'll say, well, do you believe in heaven and hell? And I'll say, well, it, it, it depends what you mean by that. No, 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 just answer the question, yes or no, do you believe in heaven or hell? The challenge is, is that in their mind is a full meaning of that term. They believe hell means something and heaven means something. They might mean something like a lake of fire and torture, literal and physical, and sitting on clouds playing a harp to be really cheesy. So if I answer yes, then automatically they're going to think that's what I believe. And that belief system, which is their belief system about the meaning of heaven and hell, gets ascribed to me. Um, this is often what happens with the unity of religion. It will be that, well, if I say I actually believe Islam is a divinely revealed religion, that actually means that Rob, A, believes the social teachings of the Quran should be applied to today, and B, believes what my Sunni friend tells me Islam believes. That is not the case. It is that they are a divine fountain that was revealed by a divine physician in that age according to its sociological, epistemological, even linguistic and spiritual context. That is the unity of religion. O thou seeker after truth, the world of the kingdom is one world. The only difference is that spring returneth over and over again and setteth up a great new commotion throughout all created things. Then plain and hillside come alive, and trees turn delicately green, and leaves, blossoms and fruit come forth in beauty infinite and tender. Wherefore the dispensations of past ages are intimately connected with those that follow them. Indeed, they are one and the same, but as the world groweth, so doth the light, so doth the downpour of heavenly grace, and then the day star shineth out in noonday splendor. O thou seeker after the kingdom, every divine manifestation is the very life of the world, and the skilled physician of each ailing soul. The world of man is sick, and that competent physician knoweth the cure arising as he does with teachings, counsels, and admonishments that are the remedy for every pain, the healing balm to every wound. It is certain that the wise physician can diagnose his patient's needs at any season and apply the cure. Wherefore, relate thou the teachings of the Abha beauty to the urgent needs of this present day, and thou wilt see that they provide an instant remedy for the ailing body of the world. Indeed, they are the elixir that bringeth eternal health. In the beginning of this passage, from Abdu Baha, there are a host of issues that arise. One is that the, the, the Baha'i faith believes that a new revelation is like a divine springtime, that it is bringing back the freshness and the beauty and the life of a previous spring. In addition to that, that these revelations from a Baha'i perspective, or from this Baha'i's perspective of the Baha'i faith, um, are themselves not some disparate, uh, you know, if you will, pulses of light at different times, that they are in some way intimately connected with each other. And that to be able to see how they are intimately connected, there is to, if you will, perceive of it as if you're looking at different members of a family or different members of a larger community, which all live in, say, one village, and that this is a divine physician going around and treating the ailments and the sickness of this or that soul. Uh, as well, it's stating that actually these teachings are themselves the, if you will, the health and balm for the suffering of an individual, an individual psyche, an individual heart, an individual mind, and enables them to live a life of purpose and serve humanity in the best way possible. And it is this, that we are the people are being asked here by Abdu Baha to look at the cure proposed by Baha'u'llah. 
and to see how they actually address the urgent needs of the present, because you can see that they are the remedy for the ailing body of the soul. So just as the previous revelations can be understood in many of their facets to have been remedies given to the human body politic in order to heal and can cause damage if applied now, but also that's how we can see that these are, if you will, intimately connected to each other. This is a way of testing the claims of Baha'u'llah in this day. The passage continues. The treatment ordered by wise physicians of the past and by those that follow after is not one and the same. Rather does it depend on what ailest the patient. And although the remedy may change, the aim is always to bring the patient back to health. In the dispensations gone before, the feeble body of the world could not withstand a rigorous or powerful cure. For this reason did Christ say, I have yet many things to say unto you, matters needing to be told, but ye cannot bear to hear them now. Howbeit when that comforting spirit whom the Father will send shall come, he will make plain unto you the truth. Therefore, in this age of splendors, teachings once limited to the few are made available to all, that the mercy of the Lord may embrace both east and west, that the oneness of the world of humanity may appear in its full beauty, and that the dazzling rays of reality may flood the realm of the mind with light. In this final section of a quote from Abdu'l Baha in paragraphs 3 and 4, it addresses this issue of the Divine Physician and saying that although the remedy may change, it is to be defined by its functional purpose, to bring humankind back to health, to take a patient who is sick and heal them. And this is that why we can see that the language and expressions and communications of the Divine Physician seem different on the surface. But if we look at the aim and purpose and function of the remedy and see how what it's a trying to address within the patient itself, we can begin to see that it is a medicine, that it is truly the teachings for that error, and that these teachings are actually growing in intensity as the human body politic becomes healthier. Once it falls back into ill health, because it has become older, I can use a medicine that is more strong that can actually be applied to that patient that when they were younger they could not have taken. These principles and laws, these firmly established and mighty systems, Baha'u'llah asserts, have proceeded from one source and are the rays of one light. That they differ one from another is to be attributed to the varying requirements of the ages in which they were promulgated. To argue, therefore, that differences of regulations, observances, and other practices constitute any significant objection to the idea of revealed religion's essential oneness is to miss the purpose that these prescriptions served. More seriously, it misses the fundamental distinction between the eternal and the transitory features of religion's function. The essential message of religion is immutable. It is, in Baha'u'llah's words, the changeless faith of God, eternal in the past, eternal in the future. Its role in opening the way for the soul to enter into an ever more mature relationship with its Creator, and in endowing it with an ever greater measure of moral autonomy in disciplining the animal impulses of human nature, is not at all irreconcilable with its providing auxiliary guidance that enhances the process of civilization building. So in this quote from One Common Faith, it states that there are three distinctions here that are going on. The first is that in the revelations of God as they come throughout time in a progressive revelation, Mankind is enabled to have a more mature relationship with their Creator. Secondly, an ever greater measure of moral autonomy, an ability to, if you will, 
bring the animal impulses of humanity under control to an ever greater degree. And that this is not at all irreconcilable with providing auxiliary guidance on the plane of the social world in order to build up civilization. So therefore, to actually state that these religions, on the case of social teachings, cannot actually be one and the same because their social teachings differ, cannot seriously be considered an objection to the religious a unity underlying them, the divine unity underlying them. And that I would propose once again that having the expression of divine truths revealed in various different languages and ways of communication, if the underlying principles themselves are one and the same, or if you will, different facets of that same truth, also cannot be said to be an objection to the unity of religion. I, we know that human communication, when expressed in different literal languages, can have the same meaning. I can say, like, uh, I don't know, say, un sag buzurge, that dog is big. <laughs> and then I say it in English, and the idea underlying it is actually the same, and yet at the same time, none of the sounds, none, none of the physical manifestations of that sentence are identical. I can then translate that sentence into thousands and thousands and thousands of different languages, thousands and thousands of different scripts, even scripts that I myself make up. But the propositional content, the idea that unites them is one, and yet their physical manifestations through languages and scripts and carvings and interpretive dance, if I wanted to do so, would actually be radically, radically different. This is the same in my understanding with the religions of our world. Yes, things are actually communicated in different ways. The concept of sacrifice might actually be expressed in one case in the willingness of Jesus Christ to sacrifice himself for humankind. But we might find that, for example, in the actual willingness, for example, of the Imam Hussein in Shia Islam to sacrifice himself. We might find principles of salvation which seem on the surface to be radically different to be one and the same in their propositional content because we're looking past, if you will, the vow, what is called often the valley of names or the veil of names and look to the underlying meaning and purpose of what it is. And once again, if we find the remedy to be causing the health and development of the psyche and of the body politic, that is the purpose of the divine physician. They are all remedies. There is a subset of this teaching of progressive revelation um, which are the principles of relative progress and what I call the principle of indulgence. It is that a social concept may take a relative degree of progress and that to decry a teacher um, for having to teach a three-year-old simple or concepts is unjust. Once again, this is the concept of the evolutionary context. If we wish to understand what a revelation was attempting to do, we then have to place it back within the 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 evolutionary context that it was revealed in. We'll look at this first quote. At the stages of social development at which all of the major faiths came into existence, scriptural guidance sought primarily to civilize, to the extent possible, relationships resulting from intractable historical circumstances. It needs little insight to appreciate that clinging to primitive norms in the present day would defeat the very purpose of religion's patient cultivation of moral sense. This quote from One Common Faith is saying that the revelations revealed by God to humankind were seeking to civilize, to the extent possible, humankind. And that, yet at the same time, clinging to these prior norms, and it uses the term primitive, primitive norms, would defeat the very purpose of religion's patient cultivation of the moral capacity of humankind. That when we actually begin to look at these prior religions, this is the principle that has come up before, that clinging to some of the more primitive norms causes detriment to the body politic, because it's as if you have a, a, a physician grabbing a, a medicine that is meant for something radically different and giving it to a patient, simply because it worked over here. In this case, it's actually that this medicine, when given to this patient, will actually cause sickness. 
this does not mean from a Baha'i perspective, or from a Baha'i's perspective, that this medicine was not perfect for that time, or that it was a patient, if you will, elevation and raising up of humankind. It's that it is only when we look at, for example, the teachings of the Quran, or the teachings of the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures, or the New Testament within their social context, that we can begin to truly understand what they were attempting to do. That this actually is necessary for someone to truly understand these revelations, or else you look at something and you say, well, how could this possibly be from God? Um, this is immoral. Well, it is from our perspective. If I actually look at, say, a parent who is attempting to get a child to, like, not punch someone else when they want a toy, um, to think that actually the communication, don't punch someone when you want something, is actually primitive, it is primitive. This isn't the patient moral cultivation of a child. There are very many things that you actually have to teach children that in order to actually bring them into maturity, in order to bring them into adulthood, yes, you speak to them of nobility and justice and compassion and mercy. You give them the vocabulary of high ideals, but at the same time, you actually have to teach them things that if you saw in any adult, you would be phoning the police. <laughs> so it's important to understand this metaphor that the Baha'i Faith uses of the cultivating of one individual, humankind, from their infancy all the way up to what we believe to be our current adolescent stage, that we can now move into maturity. Um, I would like to say that I think that any honest student of religion can actually see this if we're being really, really honest about the different dispensations. How can we understand the New Testament's relationship to the institution of slavery? Um, would that have really have been the last word in the New Testament? It is telling slaves to be kind to their masters and masters to be kind to their slaves and to realize that they are actually all one in Christ. But it never actually comes out and decries the actual institution of slavery. It is talking about how a master should see his slave and a slave see and serve his master. Um, does this mean that we are actually to allow slavery in this day? Same thing goes for the Quran and the actual Torah. No, it's that actually the ailment of the eradication, in my understanding, of the principle and institution of slavery really, really, truly needed humankind to be able to see, in spite of social standing, that this individual is their ontological or existential equal. That that is actually what was the remedy necessary for that time. And to come out and actually attack Christianity because it did not address the institution of slavery might be a misunderstanding of what it was attempting to do, and what it was attempting to build. This actually brings us actually to what I call the principle of indulgence. And it's basically that religions may even ignore, or say may ignore, or even indulge specific undesirable traits as they're trying to remedy other more serious issues. This actually comes from a quote in One Common Faith. Among the most contentious of such issues in understanding society's evolution towards spiritual maturity has been that of crime and punishment. While different in detail and degree, the penalties prescribed by most sacred texts for acts of violence against either the common weal or the rights of other individuals tended to be harsh. Moreover, they frequently extended to permitting retaliation against the offenders by the injured parties or by members of their families. In the perspective of history, however, one may reasonably ask what practical alternatives existed. In the absence not merely of present-day programs of behavioral modification, but even of recourse to such coercive options as prisons and policing agencies, Religion's concern was to impress indelibly on general consciousness the moral unacceptability and practical costs of conduct whose effect would otherwise have been to demoralize efforts as social progress. 
The whole of civilization has since been the beneficiary, and it would be less than honest not to acknowledge the fact. So this principle of relative progress here is being applied, and even of the principle of indulgence, to the issue of crime and punishment. That yes, when we look into the early revelations, we find uh, punishments for certain crimes to be somewhat harsh. And then it says, but what practical alternatives existed? There were no uh, prison systems or no current uh, behavioral modification. And it says here that it was attempting to impress two things upon the consciousness of humankind. One was the unacceptability and even the practical costs of the acting out in certain ways. This in some sense is just like evolutionary psychology and evolutionary morality. The, the religions of God are trying to do these two different ways, these two different facets. One is the spiritual, if you will, ontological existence of a moral order that actually carries someone forward in the absence of the practical costs, but also the practical costs that come along with breaking the moral sphere. These two different, if you will, engines to carry forward society. Uh, this is a very, very important principle, I think. We'll see more and more as we go forward into understanding the Baha'i Faith. That it doesn't leave just the ideal and just, if you will, the, uh, the existence of a moral order. No, there is actually injunctions for civilization building that actually have reward and punishment built in. It's just that if we leave only the practical costs or the practical benefits to an action to be the guide, then actually we lose almost all of which is truly glorious about the capacity of humankind for moral action. I don't want people to avoid, um, say, stealing because they might get caught by the police or they might get shamed by someone who is their family member or friend. No, we want individuals to have indelibly imprinted on them the moral unacceptability. Both of these are going on, but it's placing it within the evolutionary context that we are really looking at when we're looking at the Jewish faith, or the Christian faith, or the Buddhist faith, or the Islamic faith. We have to remember that their world was not at all like our world. Their context, evolutionarily, was not ours. So it has been throughout all of the religious dispensations, whose origins have survived in written records. Medicancy, slavery, autocracy, conquest, ethnic prejudices, and other undesirable features of social interactions have gone unchallenged, or been explicitly indulged, as religions sought to achieve reformations of behavior that were considered more immediately essential at given stages in the advance of civilization. To condemn religion because any one of its excessive dispensations failed to address the whole range of social wrongs would be to ignore everything that has been learned about the nature of human development. Inevitably, anachronistic thinking of this kind must also create severe psychological handicaps in appreciating and facing the requirements of one's own time. This is a very intense and heavy quote uh, within the work One Common Faith from the Baha'i World Center. So it says, when we look at the written records of surviving revel revelations, we actually find things like mendicancy, slavery, autocracy conquest, ethnic prejudices, and other undesirable features of social interactions. And it says, and it's very important to focus on this, have gone unchallenged or been explicitly indulged. So unchallenged means they're not addressed. But the other aspect is, no, they were actually put within a context. They were actually utilized in the process of building up civilization. Or in some sense, the revelations might say, just go ahead. So don't worry about that right now. Let's focus on this. Right? And this sounds quite shocking when you begin to think of it. And yet at the same time, I think the more you think of it, the more sense it actually begins to make. 
it is attempting, religions are attempting to heal humanity. And if we take this issue of health and the Divine Physician once again into the forefront of our minds, we can see that this actually does apply. Imagine yourself as a Divine Physician, sorry, as a physician, and you walk into a room and you see an individual that has been injured. I myself, I'm a first aid responder. So I actually look at this individual and I see a host of ailments, a host of injuries that this individual has. What do I have to do immediately? Should I start looking at all of them or randomly moving around, just fixing whatever comes to my attention first? No, I actually have to diagnose the patient and see, in my case, is their airway clear, right? Do they have massive bleeding? Is their circulation okay? Are they in a state of shock? It is only once these begin to address that I can actually move to other issues. Because if I actually begin to address, say, a broken toe or damage to the shin and this individual is not breathing, I actually send them to their doom. So if an individual is saying to me, but look at his leg, look at his leg, and I actually have to ask, assess his airway to see if he's actually a getting air and then breathing and then whether or not it's labored, I actually I would have to tell this individual to be quiet. You have to be silent. Let me do what I'm doing. And this is so when we're actually dealing with a series of beings that actually truly do have free will in a very real sense. We are allowed, we are not controlled like robots by the Divine. We are allowed to actually drive our own car and sail our own ship. And we get into some very, very sticky situations. This is what's saying that as religions sought to achieve reformations of behavior that were considered more immediately essential at given stages in the advance of civilization. So for example, I'm just using an example from the here at the beginning, if you actually have issues of mendicancy, of wandering individuals who are begging, and that is not something that is desirable, but you actually make it structured, if you will, if you actually put supports around it while it's still allowed to go, it looks like you're, you're indulging it. I'm not saying I agree with it, but for example, safe injection sites currently in our culture is actually an, an, a, a principle of actually trying to put strat structures around a really, I would say, an evil, <laughs> profoundly evil act and highly detrimental to society and the individuals in order to actually safeguard them. I'm not saying that it's actually identical, or that I even agree with it currently. It's simply that this is a principle we understand. Um, I have dealt with friends throughout my life who have actually battled with addiction. I battled with addiction myself when I was a younger man. And when you are actually battling with such things, if I was to walk up to you and you were addicted to methamphetamines, or you're addicted to opioids, and at the same time you're addicted to sugar and you're addicted to smoking, I would really suggest that you don't walk up, that no one walk up to you and say that you should focus on quitting smoking. You're actually taking methamphetamines or opioids. It is about addressing, just like the airway and the breathing and the massive external internal bleeding of an individual, that's what you have to focus on. What is the real serious issues that can then bring that patient back closer and closer to health? This is the principle. Of indulgence. Another sub-principle here is the relative context of philosophical and theological teachings. I've, hit, I've suggested this multiple times so far throughout the session, and it is simply that as, um, in a recent quote we just read, we are trying to develop a more mature and deeper relationship of humankind with his Creator, that is, a deeper and richer understanding of the divine world, that actually as we begin to understand more about the world, we see as we look back behind us in time that that new and richer and more developed and more sophisticated understanding of really anything, be it history, mathematics, biology, sociology, or theology, or the anthropology, the nature of the human soul, etc., is is actually founded upon prior simpler notions and understandings. Again, I am a father. 
uh, of two wonderful children, and I am attempting to take these individuals who are currently only eight and six years old and make them world citizens who understand their global home and actually see all these different revelations of God and all these different belief systems as expressions of human striving towards the good. Uh, I actually do this with my children. Does that mean that I talk to them as I might talk to dear friends or individuals of my own age? No, I actually have to take that pare it down into much, much, and much more simpler principles to be able to communicate to them, which in some sense at times have to obscure some of the complexity and sophistication of my own real worldview. Uh, that's the nature of philosophical and theological teachings, of understanding what the purpose of human existence is, what the nature of God's messengers are, what the nature of God is itself, what the nature of the world is. When we're looking back at some of the dispensations of these revelations that constitute the religious tapestry of humankind, some of the times we're going back 3,000 to 4,000 years. And we have to understand that and really understand that that's actually what we're looking at. That this has been a patient cultivation, not merely of the individual moral autonomy, not merely <clears throat> of the social teachings, but also of the philosophical and conceptual understandings, the epistemological status of humankind, that this has been a patient cultivation, and sometimes within those worlds, because there are more pertinent issues at hand for the divine physician to diagnose and treat, that sometimes other things are left alone. Another aspect of this principle of the evolutionary context and the progressive revelation is what is often used in the Baha'i writings as the seasons of religion. It is that every religious dispensation when it comes into this world is a divine springtime, coming on the heels, if you will, of a winter. Then that new revelation, say it be Judaism or Zoroastrianism, for example, comes in and it brings life and purpose to humankind. The world is clothed with no meaning, new concepts, new ideas, and new understandings, and new social teachings meant to carry forward that civilization. It then actually flowers into a summer that is rich and buzzing with life, and then it yields the fruits of its harvest in the fall. That that which is brought in, the real maturity of the heart and mind of that civilization, through the inspiration of that divine gardener, then actually gives fruit. But then the cold wind set in, and then a process of decline actually occurs, and this is what begins to stir in human hearts and minds the desire for a deeper understanding, which then comes in a due divine springtime. But what are the implications of this? It's that when we look at revelations, when we look at dispensations, using Zoroastrianism as an example, that we should be seeing them within a natural process of composition and decomposition, of growth and decay, so that we can see that, yes, this is actual decay. This is actually where the divine teachings, the, the social teachings, for example, are no longer addressing the issues and the needs of humankind. They actually can now begin to actually cause, if you will, a pressure upon humankind, which has to be remedied by the next divine manifestation of God. And this is the process, if you will, of flexing and unflexing of the human spirit. That this is actually how growth happens. So when I look at another religion, to see that there was a stage of decay is a natural process for me as a Baha'i. Oh, and this, sorry, and this also addresses the issue of why these teachings, which once had their purpose, and which were, were once beneficial to humankind, can now begin to cause damage. It's as if you're trying to bring in the, the, the if you will, the vegetation of winter into spring. Yes, they are what gives the foundation for the new life of the new spring. As they compost within the soil, they do give their life. They are reborn in the new spring. But to go back and actually apply them now is where problems arise. This next principle, um, I often call the principle of symbolism, and refer to as the valley of names. It is simply, it's been addressed momentarily before, which is that different faiths, 
use different symbols for the same concept. And they often use language that is jarring to individuals from a previous dispensation. Uh, so we have to be able to look below the symbol, beyond the symbol itself, to understand the underlying principles that it's attempting to convey. Um, and look at the functionalism, if you will, of is this actually healing? Is this actually giving forward something that is actually to awaken humankind intellectually and spiritually and socially to a new understanding of divine, the relationship between the divine, between their own moral autonomy and the process of civilization building? Here in the principle of symbolism, we take some things that like, very often can actually cause shock to people. Um, and sometimes if we're in that community, we don't really have a sense of how shocking or jarring some of these principles might have been. Um, when we look, again, it's a very intense example, at the uh, uh, Christianity in the New Testament, and it's reaching out to the Jewish community. In the Gospel of John in chapter 6, uh, I believe 666, um, John, oh, sorry, Jesus actually says to the Jews that they should uh, drink of his blood and eat his flesh. And often in the Western Christian context, this doesn't sound odd, but until you remember that this is Jesus, a Jew, talking to Jewish people who have kosher food laws and are not allowed to drink blood, let alone eat human flesh. And this actually, we see in the context, actually upsets not just merely the Jews themselves, but actually upsets Christ's disciples. Um, and this is something that when a Jewish individual would hear, this would be jarring. This is the principle of the Divine Assayer we'll look at more deeply in the future. But for now, it's, is that really what Jesus Christ was saying? Is that really what he meant to eat human flesh and drink human blood? No, of course not. Um, he's actually trying to convey a spiritual truth through a, I would suggest, a rather jarring <laughs> uh, symbolic form. Um, but there's other aspects of this, the valley of names, that can cause us to, if you will, have the underlying principle or meaning veiled. Um, I lived in Asia for several years, and oftentimes when you go to a Buddhist temple, you will see these grand paintings, some of them exquisite, and others, coming from a Western context, uh, it looks like I'm looking at demons. Uh, some of the, the Buddhist creatures, if you will, and divine beings, really look like fang deities and are quite jarring, especially imagine if you had come there as a Christian. Imagine walking up to a temple, another example to add, and you see a whole series of swastikas with a whole bunch of creatures that look actually like demons. Now one, you would, uh, if you had a gut reaction to this, I think in some ways that's, that's to be understood. But you're not really looking at demons and a symbol that we associate with Nazi Germany. <laughs> you're actually looking at a symbol and divine beings who are showing forth, showing forth, sorry, if you will, the ferocity and defensive capacity of the divine order of Dharma. Um, um, I remember actually I lived in Yemen with my wife and we taught English there. And I remember I was talking to many of my many of my students who are Muslim. And I remember one day they were actually discussing Buddhism. And they actually said, you know, but in the end, Buddhism could never actually be a divine religion. It is it is only error because, you know, they 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 they, they pray to like a tooth or like, you know, like a rock. And they were talking, for example, of relics of the Buddha, right? And they're also talking about, uh, if you will, uh, statues of the Buddha. And I said, well, one, that may not actually have been the original intent uh, uh, of Buddhism. Yet at the same time, like I, I can empathize. I can truly empathize with this. Uh, because I know this other religion, it's very peculiar to me as well for the same reason. Because all of them, really, like the entire community of this religion, uh, literally like bow down to like a, a cube of rock with like a black stone in the side of it. And obviously, they sort of jumped up and got startled. And I said, yeah, they're called Muslims. They played like a, like, a, like a rock chunk building. And I'm speaking of the Kaaba in Mecca. Uh, and I'm smiling, <laughs> and I have a good relationship with these people. 
And of course they get up, no, no, teacher, that's, that, that's not actually what we mean, what we're doing. We're not actually praying to, praying to the rock. And I said, yeah, and I don't actually think Buddhists are actually praying to that statue. I don't think Hindus are praying to that statue. I think it is being used as a symbol and a representation of some spiritual truth, some covenant, some relationship um, that you yourself are doing when you pray five times towards the Kaaba and Mecca. It's once again that we can actually have a functional similarity with a surface radical difference. Um, this is another example quickly was I'm, once I was sitting with my wife and a friend of ours and this individual said to me, um, I don't believe in judgment. I believe in karma. And I said, I don't think those are quite as different as you might believe. Because in each case, now we, we won't go into karma judgment here today, but I said, you have to understand that in each of these cases, there is a moral order. A moral order unto which you are held accountable, unto which you are judged against, and which the ramifications of one's behavior are then meted out upon the individual that actually did them. No matter what concept one might have of anatman, no self within Buddhism, it is not someone else who actually has, if you will, the ramifications or the consequences of their own karma. Um, no matter what your view in Hinduism, in karma, there is a moral order that you are actually held and judged against, and the consequences of that act are meted out from the moral order of creation. And I would suggest that why one might see this as radically different than judgment in Christianity, when we begin to try to hash out what those symbols, what those stories are trying and attempting to communicate to us, that they're not remotely as different as most people think. This brings uh, us to another principle, which is I call the principle of intelligent reading or literal versus non-literal. So I really, really, really believe that taking religious texts literally in their most obvious and physical manifestation is not taking them seriously. That we have to understand as best we can uh, from original languages and internal definition in their evolutionary context, what this story might be attempting to tell us or convey to us. And I would suggest that Plato's cave, the idea of the cave and the archetypes and the forms, excuse me, that Plato shares, where individuals are tied in a cave with a rock wall behind them and they can't turn their heads and there's a fire beyond it where people parade these clay figurines and we only see the shadows. And that we have to, as Plato tells us, escape our chains and get out of the cave to see the true forms because we're only seeing the shadows, say, of, you know, like a clay figurine of a horse. And when we can perceive the platonic forms, we will see what a horse really looks like and understand this. Um, I would suggest Plato in no way remotely is attempting to convey to us that we are actually literally and physically chained to a rock in a cave with a rock wall and a fire behind us. Uh, he is attempting to convey, to share with us philosophical concepts and is actually utilizing the principle of metaphor analogy to share those ideas with us I would even propose because he has no other choice. Um, we're going to be doing a talk on symbolism and philosophical encrustation in symbols in the future, but for now I would charge anyone to try to actually spend a day looking at their own language, because you can't look at your own language, physically speaking, and tr see how much of one's own language is actually shared through physical concepts. And to see how you could convey as an exercise the ideas enshrined within Plato's cave without using metaphor and analogy. It would be a really, really good process. So I myself, when I look at these divine revelations, I do not take, for example, them to be merely expressing actual historical truth, but are rather using the only means we have, which is language, and the best means possible, which is metaphor, symbolism, and analogy, 
to convey deep philosophical and spiritual truths about ourselves and about God and about reality in general. Um, it is through this, I, I have another quick example, I do not believe that Charles Dickens, in writing A Christmas Carol, is attempting to tell us that there are ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future, but that A Christmas Carol is actually sharing ideas of profound truth through the metaphor of these ghosts, of the life of Ebenezer Scrooge, and is trying to give us understandings of what is important. There's just a quick example to think on. Um, for now, here's a quote from Abdu'l-Baha. Our Father will not hold us responsible for the rejection of dogmas, which we are unable either to believe or comp comprehend, for He is ever infinitely just to His children. So we're not held responsible for the rejection of dogmas that we cannot comprehend. This doesn't as absolve us of the duty to investigate. Um, we have that duty as well. So that's why I bring this up in the context of the value of names and symbolism and intelligent reading. Uh, we can't look at something like Jesus Christ telling us eat his flesh and drink his blood and go, that's out, that's ridiculous. Right? How could I eat his body? Uh, it's, we have the duty to investigate and try to understand this. Um, this next quote comes from Abdu'l-Baha as well. All the texts and teachings of the Holy Testament have intrinsic spiritual meanings. They are not to be taken literally. I therefore pray in your behalf that you may be given the power of understanding these inner real meanings of the Holy Scriptures and may become informed of the mysteries deposited in the words of the Bible so that you may attain eternal life and that your hearts may be attracted to the kingdom of God. May your souls be illumined by the light of the words of God and may you become repositories of the mysteries of God for no comfort is greater and no happiness is sweeter than spiritual comprehension of the divine teachings. So in this passage from the Promulgation of Universal Peace, Abdu'l-Baha is telling us that all the texts and teachings of the Holy Testaments have spiritual meanings, intrinsic spiritual meanings, and we're not going to be taking them literally. Does this mean they contain no literal fact? No, it means that there are deeper meanings, and as it says, mysteries deposited in the words of the Bible. There is a beautiful aspect to this quote, because at the end it says, For no comfort is greater, no happiness sweeter, than spiritual comprehension of the divine teachings. That this is actually the greatest happiness, and the sweetest things in our life, and we can be, begin to underlock and understand how these holy scriptures relate to our own selves and to human existence. On the concept of literality versus symbolic and figuratism, figuralism, <laughs> um, philosophical reading of scripture often appears to some uh, either as a betrayal, as if we're trying to you know, rip apart what it actually was trying to say, which was the literal and physical aspect, um, or just a reaction to uh, current secular or atheistic perspectives. Um, one, the first one, which is a betrayal, uh, I don't think it is at all, because it's tr treating these texts as if they are deep minds, rich with gems, about the real divine relationship between ourselves and God. Even if someone is actually wrong, even if I am wrong, I am actually treating the New Testament or the Buddhist scriptures as if they're actually divine texts. If I read, for example, just the story of Abraham uh, as mere history, I can actually just check the boxes. Okay, I know what he did, that's it. And I can leave it. Whereas if I begin to try to understand, well, how is this actually a symbolic communication of something about my life or the, about the life of the nation of Israel about, or about the relationship of God and humankind or about my duties in a covenantal relationship to the divine world, then actually it's a mulling over and a retreating of that theme, that motif of the life of Abraham as trying to squeeze out of it the sweet juices that are enshrined therein. If I treat it merely as history, it's over. 
But this brings up something is that it's only through that story's meaning that it's one, its richness can emerge, but also that it can connect to my life. That it can communicate some garment of meaning, if you will, in my life. Because if it is only history, it actually has no relationship to my life. That was Abraham's life. It is only when I see the resurrection, for example, of Jesus Christ as a meaning for my own life and the rejuvenation and resurrection of my dead self into a true living self in the light of God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, no matter how you read that phrase, that it begins to take on its own meaning in the life of the adherent. Um, this again will be a uh, presentation we'll be looking at far more deeply in the future when we look at symbolism, myth, and meaning. Divine things are too deep to be expressed by common words. The heavenly teachings are expressed in parable in order to be understood and preserved for ages to come. When the spiritually minded dive deeply into the ocean of their meaning, they bring to the surface the pearls of their inner significance. There is no greater pleasure than to study God's word with a spiritual mind. So here again in, in Abdu'l-Baha in London, we are told divine things are too deep to be expressed um, by common words. So they are given in parable to be understood and preserved for ages to come. That when the spiritually minded begin to actually look at them, we can actually pull out the meanings and significances enshrined therein, and that once again, there is no greater pleasure than to study God's word with a spiritual mind. At this point, we're going to actually jump out, but I would recommend to any of the listeners or the viewers to actually read the talk by Abdu'l-Baha, uh, Intelligible Realities and Their Expression Through Sensible Forms, found in some answered questions. Um, or Paristoc, sorry. Now, I will put it within the PDF version that is actually accessible in the description of this video. But we're going to move to another principle here, which I just say, call the, the believer does not take precedent. Now, what is this attempting to convey? Simply that the adherent of a religion does not have some more intrinsic authority on the meaning of a scripture or a doctrine, uh, it is that we all have the text. This is the principle of textual empiricism from a different vantage point. Uh, no a Christian assumes that the Jews' view of the Old Testament takes precedent. No Buddhist assumes that the Hindu expression of the Vedic pantheon, the gods and the Vedas, must necessarily take precedent over the view of a Buddhist and their understanding of these divine realities through the Buddhist scriptures. Uh, no scholar of Marxism assumes <laughs> that the Marxist believer actually has the sole authority over what Marx meant. They can be wrong. Nor the student of Darwin, right, assume the Darwinian takes precedence. In each of these cases, it is that these are uh, literature and scriptures that we can actually study to understand. And if someone in front of me who says they are the true believer of this, tells me that's not what it means, I don't care. I will listen and do my best to try to understand how they see it and take that into account when I'm reading that text. But at the same time, they do not take precedent. Another aspect of this principle I call your priest their monk, which is if you're going to actually investigate something, give it the benefit of the doubt and seek out the most intelligent representation of that belief system. This really came home to me in my own search and investigations when I was in my early, early 20s. I used to go to a coffee shop in my hometown and actually would get into debates, uh, dialogue and debates, with a group of evangelical Christians. And one day as I left the coffee shop, after a rather long and intense debate with them, I was looking out over the river in my hometown, and if you will, sort of like congratulating myself on how all that went, when something dawned on me that changed the way I viewed investigation uh, for the rest of my life. 
uh, it was that I came from a very small town. And I had been debating these individuals and criticizing Christianity for years and years and years. And I always seemed to do very well against my peers and against, say, this group of evangelical Christians from the other side of the town. <laughs> and yet I knew several priests and pastors within my home community. And with my objections and my questions, I had never, ever gone to them. I had never gone to Father Maglio at the Catholic Church at St. Francis downtown and said, these are the problems that I actually have with Christianity. What do you say? I did not bring them to an intelligent or potentially intelligent response to this issue. I took my beliefs and my understandings and I kept them to myself because I thought these were good arguments that I could defend myself from my Christian friends. Why I said this changed me is because as I began to study comparative religion, I would find, for example, that I had heard things about Buddhism that were not true. That I had heard things about Islam that just weren't true. That I had heard things about Christianity and reasons I had rejected Christianity that were not biblical. This is the principle of empirical textual, uh, sorry, textual empiricism. So when you're actually investigating some of these issues, it is to actually seek the best answer you can in your avenue of approach for investigating the unity of religion. This relates, of course, just like the believer doesn't talk, take precedent, that the majority does not, excuse me, that the majority does not rule. That to say the majority of Christians or Muslims view, for example, this text, or this doctrine in this certain way um, is not an argument. It is just simply a truth, if it is a truth, that many people within this community see this issue this way. But of course, every astronomer could believe in an Earth-centered solar system and be wrong. This is just a simple principle of critical thinking. That to say, but Christians believe X, well, there's two problems. One is that doesn't necessarily mean that that is actually a true representation of Christianity. Um, I can take it into account and I can, again, seek out their priest or their monk and try to understand as best I can from that community what their best argument is for that idea. But I'm not going to allow the majority to rule me. The principle of richness, simply put, is that we often forget how rich each of these communities is in their perspectives and different groups within them. I might be talking to a friend and they say, well, you know, that's not, that isn't Christianity. But at the same time, I actually know that it is a position of the Greek Orthodox Church. But they themselves are Pentecostal. Or they might say, well, you know, that's not, that, that's not what the Bible teaches. Well, you know, what, we, what Christianity teaches is X or Y. And I'll say, it is true that that is a position of the Catholic Church. Uh, it is not a Lutheran position, and I would suggest that they are Christian. How a, how a Sunni, for example, views Islam is not identical to a, if you will, Twelver Shia or an Ismaili. Um, there, there are very rich communities here, and oftentimes we make these different religions uh, a monolithic structure, as if they all believe one thing. But they have a process of interpretation that is often very particular to each of the communities. Someone might say, well, that's not Buddhism. What they really mean is that is not the position of two writers that they have read within the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. So to say that that's not Buddhism, well, it might be Pure Land Buddhism, or it might be Nishiren Buddhism. <laughs> it might actually be something that is explicitly taught within the Pali Canon. But to say that this is not Buddhist uh, is, is an error. Um, and the only way we can solve this is to try and do our best as human beings to look at the original scriptures, try to understand them free of their historical interpretation, explore them as deeply as we can, right? And do our best 
to try and give them an intelligent reading and a coherent reading, if you will. Um, so this brings us once again to this issue of what I would call the non-neutrality principle. We all have access to the same scriptures. We all have access to the same universe. The Catholic perspective isn't the neutral perspective on Christianity. Neither, for that matter, is a Calvinist perspective. Um, nor is the current rabbinical tradition, nor is the current Shia position, or the Zaidi position, or the Ismaili position, or any of the schools of Sunni thought. <laughs> we are each taking a look at these different scriptures and this universe together, and trying to understand what they are and what they mean, be they scriptural, textual, or even physical realities within our universe. And the question is actually, which interpretation? And we'll explore that for a second. Oftentimes it is stated that I am looking at, say, Christianity through a Baha'i perspective. And that is actually the obscuring view, which leads me to erroneously understand that revelation. I've had it told to me by Buddhists that it is actually because I'm looking at Buddhism from a Baha'i perspective that I am not interpreting properly, and that theirs is the neutral position from where we must begin. But if we understand, one, that there is a scripture that we can all look at, and that it's undeniable that there is a richness to many of these traditions, varying views within it, varying interpretations, and that we can look at the original scripture, look at their original language, and that it actually might be the orthodox, in this case, let's say, the Tibetan Buddhist position, that is actually what is obscuring, how do we then actually move through this, if you will, swamp or morass of different interpretations and understandings of these scriptures? There is no ultimate neutral position. No Christian would say, they would want to say, for example, that the Christian position is the neutral position on the Bible, but don't want to say that it is actually the Jewish position that is actually the neutral position on the Old Testament. They want to make their position the neutral position, if you will, on how the Old Testament should be read, it, read Sorry, even though that's not how Jews read it. So what do we do? I think the question is which understanding of these different scriptures really genuinely takes the text into account. Are we being honest? Are we really investigating the text? Are we abiding by textual empiricism and being wary both of the orthodox and the unorthodox? Is our presentation of, for example, this text, our understanding of it, is it make this text logically consistent? Is it a honest, intelligent reading of the text itself? Does it shed light on for future problems or other problems? Meaning is, not only is it taking the actual empirical structure into account, uh, is it not self-contradictory, right, uh, logically consistent, but also at the same time, is it fruitful? Does our understanding of this text or this section or this part of the scripture shed light on another? Is it fruitful in opening up, if you will, the scripture in an intelligent and rational way? Um, does it cohere with the world we experience? Does it really, really gel with the physical reality and the nature of reality that we see in our everyday life, the actual world we experience before we've chopped it up for philosophical neatness, if you will? Um, does it offer an interpretation of, say, this passage or understanding of the scripture? Does it offer a simple and elegant understanding of this dispensation, of this book, of this concept? Does it unify our understanding of our world? Does it take disparate phenomena and bring them together into a way that we can see them as a collective whole, as opposed to just broken off pieces? Um, I think one of the things that's important to notice is that these are actually the values in the philosophy of science of any good scientific theory. <laughs> that we're trying to say, okay, we have all these disparate views, there's all the different theories, but which one is going to 
not be self-contradictory, which one takes the text, the empirical world into account, the actual external world into account, is it fruitful? Does it unify our understanding? Does it actually shed light on other problems? Uh, does it prov provide, sorry, a set of heuristics? Uh, a way for solving problems, if you will. Does it give us a series of principles that enable us to solve issues in our world? Um, can it withstand attempts at refutation? This is another aspect, again, of the principles of any good scientific theory that we actually have to look at. If we actually start throwing things at it in an attempt to refute it, does it withstand, withstand those attacks? Does it, for example, lead to future research? Does it open up avenues of investigation that we wouldn't have thought of before and new ways to look at old phenomena? Um, I will repeat once again, <laughs> this is, these are the fundamental principles that we look for in guiding us for the investigation of a scientific theory. Does it take the empirical world into account? This includes the text. Is it logically consistent? Is it fruitful? And I would even put in here, it's technology. In this case, it would be the social technology of the religion in question. Does it cohere with the world we experience? Does it unify? Does it offer a simple, elegant explanation? Does it provide a way to deal with future problems we haven't encountered? Can we stand attempts at refutation? And does it lead to future research? So when you're looking at an understanding of a dispensation, of an understanding of a philosophical worldview, this is what you're looking for. The same goes when you're looking at a religious perspective, and this includes a perspective of religious unity and in individual problems. So when you're looking at, for example, the issue of, say, the Trinity as it's represented by the Christian community, and the problems that arise when one reads the Quran, can we have an intelligent reading of the New Testament, an intelligent reading of the Quran? Can we look at original languages? Can we bring them together to investigate? Yes, we can. And if we find that that actually provides an intelligent, fruitful, logically consistent, unifying perspective that unifies disparate phenomenon, and we grant it an intelligent reading as opposed to choosing the lowest rung, well, maybe that actually is a mark of truth, because it's a mark of truth in other areas. Rather than babble more on this, we'll have a quote. It is imperative that we should renounce our own particular prejudices and superstitions if we earnestly desire to seek the truth. Unless we make a distinction in our minds between dogma, superstition, and prejudice on the one hand, and truth on the other, we cannot succeed. When we are in earnest in our search for anything, we look for it everywhere. This principle we must carry out in our search for truth. It means also that we must be willing to clear away all that we have previously learned, all that would clog our steps on the way to truth. We must not shrink if necessary from beginning our education all over again. We must not allow our love for any one religion or any one personality to so blind our eyes that we become fettered by superstition. When we are freed from all these bonds, seeking with liberated minds, then shall we be able to arrive at our goal. So this quote on invented vast negation of truth, as we're nearing the end of our study, is important to understand, and to try to inculcate into our lives. Yes, it's challenging, but the ideal is not one that really can be denied. Because once again, any person from any community would ask that of a member of the community outside, to put aside their prejudices, to actually look with fresh eyes to see maybe if actually can be seen in a different light. I ask that of you, and you would ask it of me. The Jew thinks the Christian should do this, the Christian thinks the Jew should do this, the Baha'i thinks the Muslim, and the Muslim the Baha'i. An atheist thinks a Christian should do this, a New Ager thinks an atheist should do this. Um, it's something that we have to be, be very aware of and when we undertake this perspective or process of avenues of approach to seek out truth. This last section I call Backfires, Blowbacks, and Boomerangs. Um, it's strange because people often object to a concept 
in a foreign tradition that is similar to one in their own. Or accept arguments from members of their own community, but deny the same argument if presented by someone else. I want to give one example. Um, a very, if you will, controversial claim, or perspective put forward by Baha'is, and very upsetting, and understandably upsetting to the Christian community, is that Jesus Christ has returned in the person of Baha'u'llah. Of course, it's important to know that it is equally as upsetting to a Christian talking to a Jew, claiming that the Messiah was Jesus Christ who came 2,000 years ago, or if it was said in his day that he came three months ago. <laughs> um, but one of the most, and a very understandable retort, is that this cannot be because it is the return of Jesus Christ. Not the return of somebody else with a, with a different name. And this individual that you refer to, Baha'is, as Baha'u'llah, we know when he was born, who he was born to, he grew up, became a man. So he cannot be the return of Jesus Christ. And I remember having a very, and it was a very loving conversation, with a Christian friend of mine, and I said, it was a long relationship, and I said, it's difficult because if I accept that principle, that it is impossible that Baha'u'llah could be the return of Jesus Christ and yet have come from the womb of someone and have been grown up, I wouldn't have to reject just the Baha'i faith, I would have to reject Christianity. Um, he found this surprising and he asked me why I would say such a thing. And I said, because in the New Testament, and I asked you to investigate this, John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus Christ, was claimed by Jesus Christ to be Elijah, an Old Testament prophet who had lived over a thousand years prior. The Jews, which occurs at the end of the book of Malachi, are waiting for the coming of Elijah before the great and terrible day of God. John the Baptist was born and grew up, and his name was John. And then he actually starts preaching the coming kingdom of God. When the disciples finally understand Jesus Christ to be the Messiah, he is asked, but is, are we told that Elijah was supposed to come first? And he says, if you will hear it, or if you will receive it, Elijah has come. And they knew that he was talking about John the Baptist. So either an individual can return and be the same individual in some sense, and this is explored within Baha'u'llah's writings, and yet have been born of a womb and grown up, or else Elijah cannot be John the Baptist, and thus Elijah didn't come, and therefore Jesus Christ cannot be the Messiah. I bring this up because this is a backfire. Um, <laughs> you might see, for example, this is very odd, as a Christian, looking at the by faith, but not have noticed that this is very hard from a Jewish perspective when they look at Christianity. Another example, quickly, uh, oftentimes I've had in the wonderful conversations with brothers and sisters here uh, from the Christian faith, the question of war in Islam. But what is peculiar is, is they have never had an issue with war within the Old Testament. Some of them have, but others, it had never actually been considered that that would have to be answered as much as that in Islam would have to be answered. Or even for someone who doesn't believe in any book, whether or not they believe war is ever just. And it's something to actually really be concerned with. Um, this is why often um, we hear this principle voiced within the Baha'i writings. The first is from the Tablet of Ahmed. O people, if you deny these verses, by what proof have you believed in God? Likewise, in the verse concerning the Spirit, he saith, And they will ask thee of the Spirit, say, The Spirit proceedeth at my Lord's command. As soon as Muhammad's answer was given, they all clamorously protested, saying, Lo, an ignorant man who knoweth not what the Spirit is, calleth himself the revealer of divine knowledge. And now behold the divines of the age who, 
because of their being honored by his name and finding that their fathers have acknowledged his revelation, have blindly submitted to his truth. Observe, were this people today to receive such answers in reply to such questionings, they would unhesitatingly reject and denounce them. Nay, they would again utter the self-same cavils, even as they have uttered them in this day. So in the first quote from Baha'u'llah, it says, O oh, people, if you deny these verses, by what proof have you believed in God? So it's saying, okay, well, if you deny, I'll use the example of Elijah, if you deny that an individual can be the same individual in some spiritual sense, it said the spirit and power of Elijah, for example, in the New Testament, and yet um, it cannot be in this case, um, by what proof have you believed in the New Testament? If you don't believe that's possible, how can you accept the New Testament in its response to the Jew? If you do not believe that there could be a case in which a prophet, who is the head of state of a group of individuals who he actually has to protect, protect and will be attempting to be exterminated by local tribes and groups, <laughs> this is the case of the Prophet Muhammad, if you do not believe that in such a case that individual when we resort to defensive warfare to protect the community, how do you answer the conquest of Canaan in the Old Testament? How do you answer some of the actions of the individuals within the Old Testament, which you yourself believe to be scriptural? How do you, for example, understand as a Hindu then, if you made the same objection to Islam, how do you understand the opening of the Bhagavad Gita? Wherein Arjuna does not wish to fight in a battle. For anyone who isn't aware, the Bhagavad Gita, a central Hindu text, takes place in the context of a battlefield, where Arjuna does not want to fight, but he actually is a warrior caste, and is supposed to be defending the community. How do you understand as a Hindu why that is acceptable, and if a similar thing is happening in the case of Islam, that is unacceptable? This gives us the understanding, if you will, of both of these cases. If you accept an argument, in the case of the spirit, right? Um, were this people today to receive answers and reply to such questionings, they would unhesitatingly reject and denounce them. But they have accepted the same kinds of ideas, the same kinds of arguments from their forefathers. Another example quickly passing to throw out there is that oftentimes I have individuals who will accept arguments about the existence, the real existence of mathematical objects, Yet when the exact same argument is presented for the existence of moral properties, they seem to suddenly spin. One it proves and the other it does disproves. This is, if you will, this issue of backfires, blowbacks, and boomerangs. They come back. This also relates to another issue, which I call the principle of nearness. There's a lot of issues, <laughs> a lot of principles here. Um, whereas oftentimes I've had the experience of hearing just a beautiful, beautiful exposition or understanding of some scripture or some philosophical concept from a very wonderful, wonderful mind, say, within the Islamic community or within the Christian community. And yet, if I said that same argument, I am seen as being heretical or completely unorthodox. And it's important once again, in the context of the principle of richness, there are some very, very exalted and intelligent and brilliant minds in each of these traditions that have proposed ways of understanding that own tradition, say a Christian to the New Testament, or a Jew to the, the Tanakh, or for example, a Muslim to the Quran, which is actually a brilliant and beautiful exposition that is, this individual is seen as a pillar of the community, but if you've voiced that position, to many laymen, it's not accepted. So it's, an, it's a wonderful exploration to understand these different traditions, to actually seek out their great minds, their priest, their monk. But at the same time, you get a, an, a, a sense of the richness of these dispensations, but also a sense of how close the bridges can be built from each side. Then at some times when we really are really open about the scripture and open about our own communities, uh, if you will, academics, 
that bridge can become very, very, very close, where it's a mere hop to, to if you will, unify two worldviews. There's just a few final principles to throw out quickly, and this one is preaching to our choirs. A note on honesty, and it is this. Too often we accept very bad arguments from people who agree with us. Too often. <laughs> and it is important for the intellectual epistemological evolution of our own communities to be able to lovingly disagree with each other and lovingly and respectfully question each other within our own communities. Um, and that once we see that an argument is not valid or does not support the conclusion we wished, we should, in that in independent investigation of truth, put it aside, rejoice, and be willing to share a better answer with someone. This is very important with our own communities, but it's also important across communities. For example, if I were a Christian and I said that it is not that Baha'u'llah could be, is the return of Christ, if I had said it is impossible that Baha'u'llah could be the return of Christ because his name was Mirza Hussein Ali and he was born in Iran. And then I actually have a Baha'i share with me the fact that, well, maybe Baha'u'llah is in the return of Christ. Uh, that might actually be true. That might, He might not be. At the same time, it is important to note that John the Baptist was Elijah and yet had been born of a womb recently and people had watched him grow up. So we know that that can happen, so it's obviously possible. Uh, it doesn't mean Baha'u'llah is the return of Christ, but it is possible that it could be, that he could be Jesus Christ and yet at the same time have been born recently from a womb, from a woman in Iran. <laughs> um, then when I hear that, not only is it important that I myself take hold of it. It's also very important that if I am in a room, this is the note on honesty part, and I hear one of my Christian brothers say, well, Baha'u'llah can't be the return of Christ, because he's not Christ, his name isn't Jesus. And this man, Baha'u'llah, was born Mirza Hussein Ali Nuri in 1817, so he can't possibly be. If I am not merely in interested in preaching to the choir. If I'm really on a path of independent investigation of truth, and I want to be intellectually honest, I should say to my Christian brother, you know, I don't believe actually Baha'u'llah is who he said so either. The one thing I do know is that this argument doesn't work. Because were to I accept this, I would have to claim that it would be impossible that John the Baptist was Elijah, and I would have to take Jesus Christ as lying in the New Testament and that a prophecy had failed. And he might say, yes, but Jesus, you know, Baha'u'llah is not the return of Christ. And I could say, honestly, I don't think so either. I think there's other problems. But just to be honest, among ourselves, it does not do us well. It does not serve truth to represent it with falsity. It, the truth never needs this. So let us investigate other ways that, for example, Baha'u'llah is not the return of Christ. But this one does not lead anywhere. This is what I would call the preaching to the choir on the one hand, because I'm questioning my brother or my sister as she represents this, but at the same time a note of honesty. I myself don't believe that to be true. This is why I often say to Baha'i friends that it's important that we begin to really learn how to disagree gracefully, lovingly, and to accept that as a part of a consultation and put aside what we thought was a good argument or a truth and rejoice that we have found something new. The principle of the isolated objection. Imagine you're discussing the seal of the prophets, which is the doctrine or the dogma, or I believe, within Islam, that there can be no prophet after the Prophet Muhammad. Just imagine, for the sake of discussion, that you actually have solved that, and you can present it in a way that a person can understand, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, there actually could be. Very often what occurs in our avenues of approach and dialogue is that someone will say, yeah, but Baha'u'llah says, you know, he says he's God and he gets rid of Islamic law, so he can't be. This is again a note on intellectual honesty and a principle of isolating objections. 
I would say, okay, pause for a second. Once again, Baha'u'llah can be completely false, just like with Elijah and John the Baptist. And at the same time, the Islamic community's understanding of the seal of the prophets can also be false. These are isolated issues. So maybe, for example, there really and truly is a conscious, for the, to the degree to which we can say that, moral fabric underlying the universe. And that that moral, whatever you want to call it, actually represents itself to humankind and communicates ways that humankinds can interact and should interact with each other. And that the moral order behind the universe includes moral and conceptual truths to which men, humankind, are held accountable unto. And that that sounds very much like God, and that is completely represented within Buddhist scripture. That it is a functional definition I have no problem with. And then a person says to me, say from the Buddhist community, or someone who just knows about Buddhism, well, nevertheless, Doc, the Buddhism teaches the doctrine of no self, the doctrine of Anatman. I can easily say, yeah, and maybe I am completely and utterly wrong about Anatman, but that is a different topic. That is a different issue. It is an isolated objection. But we could have something that looks very much like a god, that is communicative, that actually represents itself to humankind, that gives a path to actually draw oneself out of the quagmire of this world towards the divine worlds, and that that sounds very much like the God that I personally read within the New Testament, or the Quran, and the doctrine of no self just kills it. That's over. So we have to try to understand, if you will, that the, for example, the doctrine of resurrection, which from the Baha'i perspective to the Christian perspective might seem very different. And if I actually begin to solve this issue, very often in my own interactions, as this begin to really try and understand each other better, and that the Christian sees that I don't see it the way they think I see it, and we come closer and closer together, I'll suddenly have, yeah, but there's no way, right? Uh, there's no other way to God except through Jesus Christ. I can say, maybe you're right. But at the same time, maybe we don't have this problem, this issue of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This brings us finally to the last principle, and thank you for spending time with me, um, that we're going to have to dedicate another section to, an actual entire one or two series, which is that of the divine assayer. It is actually how and why God tests humankind why and how we are brought towards claims and we are always presented a way out. We are always presented a way we can object, reject, and turn away. And it's that the underlying principle of it all is that goals that are worthwhile don't come for free. If I wish to actually have a serene mind, I have to train it. Genuinely train it through meditation, through prayer, through watching my mind, through breathing. It comes with a price. But this is the same if I actually want to have big muscles and a, a strong physique. I actually have to train it, I have to sweat, I have to push. There's a sacrifice involved. If I want to study a new language, if I want to understand archaeology, if I want to have a good grasp of history, if I want to learn the violin, if I want to learn a martial art, any of these come with a price. And there's always a reason not to train, not to practice, not to read. There's always a reason to turn aside on many of these roads. You will always find one. But it's an important thing to understand about the nature of the reality in which we live that it is a gym, not a spa. And the things of great worth demand sacrifice and time and work. And I think in the future we will look at how God has the same principle that we see operating everywhere at work within the divine religions. That really and truly we don't have to see the unity of religion we don't have to see the truth or the reality of God or of his messengers, but we can if we're willing to put in an independent investigation, which is based upon and necessitates the entertaining of the possibility 
that maybe all these colors are different expressions of the same underlying phenomenon. Maybe the underlying phenomenon actually exists that unites all the elements of the periodic table. That a gas is made up of the same thing of a solid or a liquid. Maybe we can really begin to entertain the possibility that we all have a common biological ancestor, but we're going to have to do research in any of these areas to find out if they're true. And maybe that's true for the unity of religion, and I hope some of these avenues of approach have shed some light on how I myself as an individual might perceive that. Thank you.